welcome to BCCAN 2022. Uh, unfortunately, we're not in Ottawa. Um, I'm myself, I'm, I'm Peter Hanstein. I'm joining you from Bergen, Norway on the other west coast. Um, this session, well, who I am, well, in, I've been running OpenBC for, for quite a while as a system and user. Wrote the book of PF, which is now in its third edition. Uh, I blog at beastly.blogspot.com uh, occasionally. And uh, yeah, well, I guess I'll do another book any decade now. Uh, over to um, co presenter Max. Yeah, hello. Um, well, differently from Peter, I don't have a uh, published book yet. I have a couple of. Uh, published RFCs, but that's just something I've been punished with. And um, I work at the Internet Society as a technical advisor for the, uh, mainly focusing on Europe. Um, but my past is, uh, as, uh, as title, well, the title, the, the slide says, I'm an IPv6 enthusiast. Uh, so I used to be the IPv6 program manager at the Ripen CC, which is uh, the, um, organization that hand, hands out IPv4 and IPv6 addresses in Europe, the Middle East, and Central Asia. And um, I run my own autonomous system. That's where I'm talking uh, to you from. Um, and so um, I run a FreeBSD-based and BERT-based autonomous system. Um, but you can see some of what I do on, on my website and on uh, Twitter. And over to instead Tom which is the new addition for the, this year's um, tutorial. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Smith, um, Technology Director of Wireless Connect, uh, kind of a small ISP in Ireland that we founded uh, to address the digital divide. Um, I've been following Peter Hanstein secretly for a long time, and I've been enjoying the fruits of... Uh, Max Stucci's uh, efforts in the RIPE NCC and his colleagues, uh, and the former colleagues in the RIPE NCC. So um, I found both of their training materials phenomenal. And the book, I have to say, um, uh, Peter Hanstein wrote on the book of PF was a phenomenal uh, introduction uh, to the fire, uh, packet filter firewall from OpenBSD. So, um, so I, I'm a bit starstruck to be standing beside these guys, but uh, and I've attended many of these courses in, that they have had in person, because there's always something new to learn and there's always that experience to, to, to share. And to be honest, that's one of the things I love about the BSD CAN, um, and I really do appreciate the work of Daniel and his team. And I just want to say, like, while it's unfortunate we're not in person this year, uh, I really have to say I really do admire the, the work uh, and appreciate the work that the lads have put in to make this possible even in a virtual sense and I really am looking forward to meeting up with all of you in person next year and uh, um, so thanks guys for um, for having me on and I'm really looking forward to contributing uh, to this training session. Right thanks Tom. Now uh, well, this is obviously designed for a uh, for an in-person session. Uh, Dan, can we uh, have, have people speak up, like a quick introduction about yourself, your name, your favorite BSD, your experience with networking, your experience with PF, and your goals for this session. Is, is that doable, Dan? Or we can just barge ahead i guess if people people can just open their microphone and say so i think yeah. the best the best way would be to go around um i see that there was uh steve with his camera on and open his mic earlier so maybe if you want to introduce yourself start with uh, i didn't intend to have my camera on but That's i okay. am uh, i'm steve from toronto i work at blue cat networks uh and um yeah, that's about it. Right. Anyone else wants to introduce themselves? Hello, I'm Len from Ottawa. A not very sunny day, so you're not missing much by not being here. But uh, 
I agree that it would have been better. Uh, but for me, it's just down the street. Uh, and uh, I look forward to this tutorial. Thanks. Thanks, Lam. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Here, here's somebody coming up. Hi, my name is Nigel Young. I'm over here in Ireland with Tom, whom I know. And uh, I, I used to have my own little wireless internet um, service. Uh, so, yeah, that's, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer for my sins on both, uh, in both the United States and over here. So I, I'm deeply interested in what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nigel. Thanks. Anyone else want to speak up? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah, I guess we'll uh, um, we'll just go, go on that. Um, our basic agenda here is, as you see here, first of PF basics followed by an exercise. Nat redirects, uh, this is the second chunk. Um, uh, again, followed by, by exercises, uh, hosting services will be uh, uh, next uh, with an exercise. Uh, then we go back to traffic shaping, uh, which some of us are a bit rusty about, but we'll, we'll see what, what happens. Um, and then various tips on troubleshooting, and finally ending up with an exercise in NAT64, which is um, kind of exotic still for, for quite a few people. Um, PF Basics um, is a little useful to remember where we come from. Um, OpenBSD used to use uh, Darmy's IP filter, uh, which he had well, one, of, one of the first packet filtering uh, subsystems written. Turned out that was uh, almost but not quite BC licensed, so it was ripped out of OpenBSD. And fortunately, uh, Daniel Hotmeyer had a working prototype lying around, so it only took that one release uh, from, well, from May 29th, 2001 until actually a month later, they, there was a replacement. Uh, but the OpenBC 3.0 release was pushed to December 1st instead of November 1st by that effort. Um, anyway, it started, uh, uh, the license problem led to a license audit of the source tree and the ports tree. Uh, but you can you, know, you can read about that at uh, several places, among them on my blog. So, but for the present, uh, the practical side here. Um, network Design 101 is, um, well, building the network you need, the maintainable network you need. You probably want to start with something simple as we do here, which is basically a couple of hosts. Uh, in a modern world, you want to think dual stack, both IP version 6 and IP version 4. Um, I, uh, we will not be taking bets on how, how long IP version 4 will be surviving. Um, you know, IP version 6 has been around for a while, so well, we'll just leave that for now. Um, anyway, your network will have users uh, who will have need to access local and remote services, and uh, uh, we'll also be needing to uh, considering their um, uh, security requirements. Uh, you probably will also want to offer services, uh, access to services elsewhere, and uh, maybe you will want to expose some services to the world yourself. Anyway, uh, what we're trying to teach here is the method to keep things simple, but not stupidly simple, which is just as simple as, as you can do it and a little simpler. So, how do you build rule sets like configurations, PF uh, configurations like commonly called rule sets? Well, your basic rule format is the verb, criteria, actions, and followed by options. Like the one here, pass in on egress, proto TCP to, to egress port SSH, or match out on egress, not to egress. What these things do is the first one is passes in on the interface group that consists of an inter interfaces that have a default route. Basic, well, in your simple setup, that usually is a simple setup. You have one interface that has a default route. You may have several interfaces, but you know, routing, that's where routing tables come from. So the first one here basically says from 
anywhere uh, pass traffic to the uh, uh, default route interface uh, to the port that SSH uses. Next one is match out on egress and NAT to egress. Well, that's your NAT rule. Anything from anything that passes out uh, via the default route gets natted to the, the IP address that uh, the egress interface has. And the final one, block all. Um, if you had, I'll tell you a little secret, if you, <clears throat> if you had exactly those rules in your rule set, everything would be blocked. Um, uh, but anyway, these, these are basic building blocks. Um, we can, uh, there are all the things you can do like making your, making your rule set maintainable by using some tricks here. One is macros. You have a macro name and its definition. You have a table and tables are for storing IP addresses and IP ranges. And you have some stuff like queues if you want to, as, as we'll be getting back to later, uh, do traffic shaping. You can also set options for specific, uh, well, options that we will also get back uh, get back to. Um, and uh, if, you, if you have an open BC system or you know, the web browser, if you go to the, the link there, uh, manopenbc.org uh, pf.conf, uh, you will find a very good, very good man page there. There's of course also the book that uh, Tom mentioned earlier. Now, constructing a rule set go from safe uh, beginnings, block by default. Actually, you could have a six, uh, six byte uh, pf.conf, which is totally secure and it says block, which expands to block, drop, drop for all. No, nothing will pass. That's totally secure, but probably not all that useful. But Simple rules for a client is the one we have here. You block by default and you pass from self. Self is a uh, default, is a, a built-in macro that expands to the, um, the IP addresses of all configured local interfaces. Expanding on that, well, with that um, rule set, this is what the, the output the actually loaded rule set on my laptop in my home network when I created this slide looked like. Uh, the command up there, PF control, PF control is what you used to, um, to handle PF configurations. Now, uh, the PF control uh, verbosely do not load the read from the file. Well, that's what the uh, options say here. So our simple rule set here, two lines actually expand to, well, block drop all, and all those past rules that um, correspond to locally, in, uh, uh, locally con configured uh, interfaces. Uh, my, uh, my present configuration is slightly different, but you, know, you get the point. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, the sequence of you know, things in the rule set matter. Rule sets are evaluated from top to bottom. The last match wins. So in the first one there, you, we would actually end up with what would be effectively be block all. You can skip, skip that using uh, quick, which we'll get back to. We're stateful by default, which means that the, um, uh, uh, the firewall keeps track of what um, what, what connections you uh, you have open and will uh, will match traffic to to existing connections if such things exist. Again, the uh, the, the most extensive documentation is in the, in the uh, pf.conf man page, and you can probably open that in a in a browser window uh, separately from this. Um, a rule set can contain these things. You have options for general co configuration, macros that we have already mentioned, but not really explained. It was contact that will be expanded in place. You have tables, for example, for when your, when your macro list of IP addresses just becomes too long, you stuff them in a table, which is actually more efficient as well. You can have redirections, including uh, 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 network address translation, 
And then you have rules for filtering, uh, which is when how PF should um, treat your, your traffic. Um, the order of uh, these items in the rule set used to be important, but the parser became a, a little more liberal uh, over time. So it's not really important. You can have them. Um, well, um, rule set structure uh, is more about uh, maintainability for yourself than uh, the actual technical uh, considerations. Now, options. These are general configuration for PF subsystem. It's useful for like changing whatever default is for, for some settings, such as the, uh, the default limit for simultaneous states or connections. I think it's as low as 10,000 in the, uh, the default, uh, because OpenBC sometimes sometime runs on very limited hardware. Uh, I typically set it to a million, or with 100% here. So set limit states, uh, 100,000 here. Or you could do something like set the uh, verbosity of logging, debug. You can set you can set which interface you care about logging for. Uh, so timeout. Uh, these are the timeout values for when uh, uh, when uh, connections will be closed. You can have them extremely long if you like. All these uh, uh, things are really well explained in the man page. So we're a little pressed for time. So. I'll, I'll answer questions later if um, necessary. Macros. Macros is uh, great read, read, are great read, readability tools. Basically, the, they will have content that will be expanded in place during um, uh, rule set parse before load. Um, and it's, well, uh, there are some rules from they must start with a letter digit, digit, digit underscore. And uh, you have a few examples here. Typically, um, you do if you don't use the um, interface group name, you, you would say a macro that defines what your external interface is. You can have a list of old interfaces uh, like the one we have here. And then you can refer to those macros, uh, or, well, a prefix with a dollar sign, a pass out on the external interface from, from anywhere to anywhere, which is very uh, liberal. And uh, you have another one which will pa uh, pass traffic in on, again, your external interface to, uh, to anything that listens on port 25. Interesting. Uh, and you can also have uh, things like port ranges or address ranges. You have Bacula ports here for the backup software back Bacula. And uh, you have here a, a uh, an IP address range that is used for something called DMZ hosts. Uh, probably be referenced later in this tutorial. Now, tables. Tables are a uh, fairly compact uh, data structure that is intended for uh, for IP addresses, uh, including network addresses only. Uh, you can stuff anything else in there, but say you have a number of networks or uh, or uh, single IP addresses you want to uh, treat specially, uh, you can just Put them in, in that uh, table and um, refer to that any mem uh, any member of the, that table via the uh, the rule example here. That, um, like you define your table brute force for some um, for some reason, uh, and you just later block from members of brute force by a simple command here. Um, the one important difference between macros and uh, and tables is that tables uh, are referenced directly. They do not generate a uh, several rules like the the macros would uh, would as we saw in the previous examples. Now tables have another uh, in interesting feature is that in that they, you can actually manipulate them from the um, uh, from the command line, or you can load them from files. This this uh, first rule here actually has you populate the, the table at rule set load from that file. Uh, you can also do things like if you have <clears throat> long living definitions uh, that you want to have survived reboots, you could do something like, uh, uh, well, once you, you loaded from that file, but you can also maintain that file by uh, exporting while PF control show 
uh, to that file and it will survive your, your reboots. And then again, uh, you can uh, mani manipulate uh, table contents directly by, uh, by using PF control uh, minus uh, lowercase t, table name, uh, uppercase t command. Here it's add, we add those addresses to, to your file. Um, at least on OpenBSD, there are several daemons uh, that can interact with and maintain tables um, in your rule set. Uh, when, uh, the most famous ones are SpamD, the um, spam referral daemon, but also the uh, BGP daemon, uh, uh, routing daemon, and DHCPD, which is well um, the, the one that assigns uh, IP addresses. I think there's a we have a, an example of those later. Now, implement your spec. You have a spec. Very simple at this point. How do you, would you do this in your home or um, small home office infrastructure? Well, let's have a go. Exercise one, protecting your host. Uh, here is, I know some of you have signed up for a lab environment that should be available via uh, labs.pftutorial.net. If you go to uh, that one, and this, this is possibly where uh, Tom should be uh, explaining a little bit about how the, the labs are set up. Okay, folks, how are you doing? Um, so we have a lab set up, it's called uh, labs.pftutorial.net. Um, and so what we're going to have to do is uh, anyone who wants to subscribe uh, uh, can log in with a lab number. So it's lab number X and then the password. And the password is a very secure password. It's BSD all caps and then capital P password and an exclamation mark. So uh, the, the, it's going to be... So there's 19 labs currently, so from 1 to 19. So if you log in and you see someone else type, you maybe just log out and log back in as a different lab number. So it's a bit of a free-for-all uh, just due to the time constraints we've had. Um, but if you want, it should be there. Um, and what you should see is two virtual machines, one being an OpenBSD host just on a command line console, uh, it should work in any HTML5 capable browser. So it won't work for, I don't think it'll work in links. I'm uh, pretty certain of that. But um, but uh, it maybe will. So, but I, I'm not guaranteed it. But it certainly works in Chrome. Uh, Len, you have your hands up. Uh, yeah. Um, on my site, I'm going to uh, the website you said. It's PF. Yeah. And it says secure site not available. Okay, so if you, can you click on the accept? It's just a certificate error because it's oh, just okay. a site cert on the. Uh, so it's not a big. Well, it could be Big Brothers uh, sniffing, but uh, it's actually just the the cert is is just a self site cert. So if you could go against all best practice and just ignore that warning and proceed, it should work fine. Okay. Every, every security product has that with a with an invalid certificate. <laughs> yeah. Can I <clears throat> can I ask you to repeat the username and password again? Sorry. Yeah. Um. I I think uh, if you want to, Peter, do you want you your share of the screen? Do you want to just open up a, a text file and we'll just put it in there? So it's lab all lowercase number. So it's one to nineteen. So lab one will be the username for lab one. Lab 19 will be the username for Lab 19. And the password is capital BSD, capital P, and then it's, uh, it's uh, password. So it's BSD password with an exclamation mark at the end. That exclamation mark is for security. So I've just told the entire internet to pass it to the lab. So, uh, well the internet that's listening, so. Uh, uh, when you do get in, uh, I think that the first thing to check is that PF is indeed loaded. Uh, and uh, you might want to just uh, look up PFCTL 
man pfctl is uh, how you find out how to check that and once you've done that um see if you can do stuff like ping the other hosts in the lab okay um next point is um configure the external interface on the gateway uh openbc comes with two um two standard edges, uh, VI and MG. MG is very close to Emacs, but it's only an editor. Uh, so your editor of choice. Uh, and um, I think the convention here, Tom, would be that um, your, uh, your last octet in the uh, IP address would be the same as your lab. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we can, we can set that up. Uh, just, I think uh, Alejandro Lorenzo had a question. Yes, um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Um, I was trying to log in and I can't log in. I was, I was just wondering if it's a BSD all in caps and then caps yes. for passwords with an okay, S. Hold on, I, it's password. I'll just put it in here to everyone. So that's the password there on the Zoom yeah, chat. Okay. And um, lab in all lowercase. Okay. Len, you had a question. Or is it just your hand is stuck up? Oh, my hand must still be stuck up, sorry. But I no actually problem. have the same question. I actually typed exactly what's there for lab 17. Hopefully no one else is grabbing yet. And uh, it's not logging me in. Okay, lab 17, let me just see. Sound a quick look. No, nope, login failed. Yep. Okay, give me one second there. I'm just going to reset your password just in case. Try it again there. And I'll just double check that you have permissions. Oh, well, there's a question from uh, Jan uh, Bramkamp here. Uh, did the VMM host run on TTYs again? Because it says with uh, lab 14, doesn't work with lab windows. I know, but it's related to the, remember the issues we had last year where we, we right. would run out of, uh, no, last year, the last time we did the labs in, in person. Yeah, which must have been uh, 2019 or something. <laughs> so. so is everybody you know, getting in? Uh, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, this will be a a, a, a text a editing text files exercise. Um, so uh, last octet uh, in the uh, IP address there would be the um, uh, yeah you know, the, the number of your lab, um, and again in the on its six address. Um, and then your res resolve.com, it probably has some uh, content already, uh, but uh, just type in those there. And once you've done that, you can do an at net start. Uh, you will be logged in as root, so you don't have to worry about uh, sudo or, or do as as it is an open beast. And so now, if you have have that one, next one go on to on the gateway. You have uh, start with a very simple rule set. We start with locking, and then you pass quick from that specific range, which I think.
You can add the pass from self uh, afterwards. And then reallupf.conf. Uh, I would I would recommend always when you're making changes to pf.conf use the pf control reversely uh, uh, reversely not not load uh, pf control vnf uh, because then uh, what you will get then is the uh, the uh, the output will be the, the rule set as it actually will be loaded into memory. Um, and um, the second command then will would load it, well, or you would, if you cut out the end, uh, the, uh, the thing will, will actually load. What happens then is that the complete rule, um, if, if there are any errors in the, in the, in the rule set, doesn't parse, it will not load. Only if a completely parsed rule set will load unless really just a, a pointer in the kernel goes from the one to the other. Uh, and I would suggest here that anytime you do a rule set change, do that sequence. Check what, what the output of the first command is before you commit with the, the second. And I think I can... Um, I think I forgot to tell you at the beginning here, uh, but uh, these slides are online. Oh, sorry. I'll paste in the chat there the uh, this is the slide we're on now. So it's, if you prefer, prefer to have them uh, locally, uh, they will also magically appear uh, at the uh, same URL only it says PF tutorial instead of BSD you can 2022 uh, after this session. And I want to paste the password. Pardon? Could someone paste the password into the yeah. Uh, I think I pasted it already, but I'll just do it again here. Uh, direct message. Okay, send it to everyone. Just one second there. I'll just retest that. I'm just going to test a couple of random ones. Okay. Right. So uh, when you have the when you have a uh, does everybody have a uh, loaded rule set at this point? Then um, Um, when you do have, yeah, Max says, when one should, should I screen and do the exercise? That's probably a good idea. Um, uh, I think you could probably. I think, Tom, would you share your screen and show us? I'm I'm, sure I tell you, I'm busy, just there's just one step missing okay. in the labs. Um, so if I can get you to, if you, a uh, lab one should be active and uh, I'll play catch up with the others there for you. Okay, so one second then. Um, then Peter, it's better if, like, since you're sharing the screen and you're the only host, I was actually realizing it in the meantime. Let's see. Whether I actually have some of this lying around. Um, yeah. uh, I suppose then I will.
So labs one to four should be fully functional. And I'm playing catch up with the fix on all the others. Now, if you can see the... Um... Yes, we can see that. Yes, so... Yeah, okay, guys. Um, so up to lab six is up and running, and lab seven is coming online. Lab eight's online. So we got the uh, uh, config. <clears throat> lab 10 oh interesting oh I made a mistake here <laughs> Uh, it's almost like that you do make mistakes now good thing I have a console okay so um, lab 13 is up and running up to lab 13 should have no problem Looks like we might have a routing problem here, but uh, <laughs> because the uh, this is the gateway to D does that gateway exist at all? Uh, in the chief for host, give me one second there. So I'll just do it on the console here. I'll I'll get the labs up and running for a second. Um, Max, if you want to log in on the tutor one, just double check. I will. I'll just get people into the lab, so I'll focus on that for now. In the meantime, we have Peter showing how to, how to do everything. Now, this is, of course, the, um, the default rule set that comes with uh, local BSD. Uh, we'll just 
kill all of those because uh, well, it's, it's a very it's a very useful uh, thing to have, but uh, we will use what we supply ourselves. Up to lab 16 should be fine. Anyone pipe up if they're still having trouble below 16? Okay, this is Len. I've actually logged into the VM, but when I go to the console and get a login prompt, same credentials do not work. So just try root and the BSD password. Oh, okay. So we're, we're, we're going full on root access, I know. Been a bit naughty there. Oh, we have a syntax error in line three. That's always interesting. Oh, that solved it. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Thank you for asking the question because it helps everyone else as well. Thank you. See that it's a prot zero instead of proto, uh, which is, I think, a fairly common mistake. Now, now let's see if we get a rule set that parses. And you can also load with verbosely just to see the nice little rule set again. And um, for our next trick, let's see if we can ping. Oops. I'm working that tutor now. Uh, for for our international audience, the the keyboard map is UK. Um, oh, we do not have a. We have a Tom. We have a routing problem. Okay, V six. I don't have V six uh, on right. that. One. So I, we're going okay. to be. Oh, uh, so that, that that would explain explain the. Uh, the routing problem then. Um, but let's see if we can reach somewhere out in the world. And that was, of course, misspelled. Sorry yeah, there. I was, uh, yeah, it's okay. They always misspell my surname, don't worry. So, now, um, uh, is there DNS now. resolution inside the lab? So I don't, I don't think so. So maybe no. you want to try with um with an IPv6 or IPv4 address. Try this. The one I put in the chat. Choose the router in the other room. You, you can also paste that sort of stuff onto the IRC channel. There's some people in there that aren't on Zoom. Okay. okay. Um, what? Um, well, we, we still have a, a routing problem here. <laughs> Peter, what I'll do is, if you can continue talking, I'm going to take over. Um, mm -hmm. And because you're sharing that screen, um, mm -hmm. Other people will see that, so I can just jump in. So I'll have a look at the tutor host and why that's not working. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, should I just go on talking about something else then? Yeah, if you can. Yeah, and I'll get this up running. Sorry about that. Uh, well, let's see. Pulse share. And new share. Now. What can we do here? Perhaps the most useful thing here would be to Yes. Now, this is this is where we uh, are at the moment. Oh. Well, wait, Peter, you're still sharing the terminal. Yeah, there we go. That's better. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, no, no, before no, we good. before we go back to this, can we um, we have a question? I think for Dan, which IRC server or in channel um, were you mentioning? Um, on Liberia.chat in BST can dash stream one us yeah BST can dash stream one if you want uh, a web interface you can find that on the website you go to the front page and click on stream one you should see a link to it there uh, on the web okay. page All right so anyway Anyway, the, the point, point of this ex exercise would be uh, to um, yeah, clear out, get, get a basic rule set up and running for uh, for a single host. Um, do we need some time to, to work out the love problems or should we, what's the smart thing to do here? Uh, I, th I think... I think if, if people can confirm that they've been able to set up the IPs on their labs and ping from one host to the other, just to, um, and we should resolve the routing thing uh, shortly afterwards. All right. So uh, should I just go on then to the next sec section? Or I can, I can take that one as well. Okay. You know, if if you're if you're working on the labs, we can just yeah. switch around. Yeah, that makes sense. So, what we've been seeing so far is uh, almost successfully configuring a uh, single host. Uh, what you probably will, will want to be doing is uh, communicate communicating between several hosts. So, uh, so assume we have a small network and we want to make a firewall. What is a firewall? Well. Uh, I think it was Henning who uh, told me, uh, do not use that terrible word, just call it a point of policy enforcement. Well, the firewall, the point of policy enforcement is usually uh, the gateway for a network. And it does filtering for other hosts. And you can do things like redirect traffic that needs to be treated specially, or for that matter, uh, network address translation, so you can hide hosts between uh, uh, one public address. Um, so how do we go about doing this? Well, Nat was, of course, the, um, the child, best child of uh, internet com commercialization. Um, back in the day when IP, uh, TCP IP was constructed, computers were big and had multiple users. And 4 billion, 32-bit oh, address base for a little more than 4 billion hosts, uh, that would be enough for anybody. Uh, uh, somewhat reminiscent of what one software entrepreneur said about 640K memory. Uh, so 
by the time, by the early 90s, when uh, the internet was actually being commercialized, these smart people realized that they would be running out of IP addresses pretty soon. So a um, little dirty trick they came up with was network address translation. It means that you can have one publicly exposed uh, IP address, you can have a network uh, behind that, and that the machine that has the and the uh, public IP address does translation for the other hosts. And there was even the RFC 1918 came out uh, quite some years ago with specific IP ranges that were never ever to be seen on the public internet, were just for your local networks. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth over that. And uh, there is the thing called IP version six, but how we do it in modern PF is that on your netting hosts, you have a rule similar to the first one here. You match out on, you could have said egress, um, and you net to the IP address of that external interface. Uh, the brackets here, uh, parenthesis here is to, um, to compensate for uh, dynamically um, uh, dynamically assigned uh, addresses. Um, so uh, without the, uh, the parenthesis, uh, your, uh, the IP address that expands there would be uh, the, uh, the one that was there at the rule set load. If there's any chance that the, the IP address can, can change, use the parenthesis. Now again, the trick uh, here is to, in OpenBSD at least, you can use the interface group egress uh, such as in the second rule here, so you match out on egress to the IP address of egress. In the modern networks, we should also have IP version six, which is the noted INET six. Uh, hopefully we'll have that running at some point. Um, well, what we are building is a filtering gateway, which makes decisions about which packets pass and will maybe packets that, um, need special um, treatment. First thing to do is if you are able to enable, uh, or you do, if you do forward traffic for somebody else, well, you need to enable forwarding. And uh, with OpenBSD that is done via CCTLs, you can do it from the command line with CCTL net.inet.ip.forwarding equals one. And the same for IP version six, only you need IP, INET six, IP six forwarding. Or you do the sensible thing or one does not exclude the other. You edit your sctl.conf and put in those values there. Uh, I think they're there in the default the sctl.conf, but it commented out. Oh, the minimal gateway. Well, do you not for IP version four? You probably do, unless you unless you have already hoarded some less scarce resource uh, IP versions for addresses. You're on IP version six, let's assume you do. Now here is a minimal rule set for a gateway. You define what the external interface is, you know what your internal interface is. Well, this sits between one network and the world. So of course you match out on egress for INET addresses, not to the address of your external interface. You start on the blocking all, and then you're really liberal and you pass anything that originates in your local network or on the host itself. Uh, you notice here that the pass rule here is without uh, INET or INET6, so it applies to both. Now keep in mind, this is your base way, um, baseline for whatever policy you have in place for creating, creating those packets. Next up, now let's see how we use some macros and some policies. Uh, this is a uh, bastard, bastard child of a uh, gateway I used to run, where we have we allow certain lists of of uh, ports uh, for our clients. Anything we have the, the definition of your client out which uh, expands to a large number of, uh, of services that our clients needed. And in addition, we need some um, services that run on uh, UDP that you define uh, separately. 
You will, of course, have noticed by, the, by now that you can use service names uh, for uh, well-known services uh, in addition to port numbers. So we match out an egress, just like the other one, but we add the, after the block here, we pass quick both TCP and UDP for the UDP services. Uh, it's common to be un unaware that domain, or that is DNS requests, will sooner or later uh, turn to TCP if, um, uh, if request size is big enough. Uh, same thing for NTP. Uh, then, so we have uh, basically name, name resolution and time uh, uh, network time uh, covered by that rule. Then we pass all of those ports uh, in the client out macro from any any host that matches the network of the internal interface. And since your admin wants to SSH in from anywhere, even from uh, wherever he is on vacation, you pass uh, pass in uh, to port SSH from anywhere. Now, at this point, what would your clients need to consume here? It's likely that whatever ran on 15999 uh, in some network for my users uh, is not necessarily useful for your users. Uh, I have a question here. Can you still reference the service like SSH in the example if it does not run on default port? Let's say SSH on 2222 instead of 22. Uh, no, sorry. It's um, uh, the, the mapping is the same one as in S services. Um, so anyway, um, the default, uh, the uh, service names are great um, for readability, uh, but if you do things like run on alternate ports, you will, uh, well, you can always use things like macros, of course, but uh, uh, do uh, load, uh, well, do test your uh, uh, rule sets verbosely uh, if you do, because, well, macros sometimes lead to surprises. Now, we mentioned earlier that uh, the HTTPD can interact with tables. Now, this is the exact example taken from the HTTPD uh, man page for how to do that. You first of all, you load the HTTPD with uh, the names of the tables, and the only way I could get those things to work is to have table names exactly like that example, and you have it running on the, that particular interface. Now you add those tables, uh, and this, uh, what happens then is that um, the HTTP it, it fills up your least IP table with uh, with the tables it has uh, allocated. The addresses uh, has allocated, um, and the other uh, tables such as the abandoned IP table, like that host went away and. It has a cer certain time uh, li lives on uh, in the allocation table anyway for a little while, and then you can use those uh, those tables to make decisions on whether to, whether to pass traffic or to treat them specially uh, later in the rule set. The uh, next highlighted rule there is you pass any TCP from members of the least IP table to the ports that are, uh, are appropriate for your clients, uh, which to uh, which boils down to uh, you only pass traffic that your DHCPD has assigned. Anything with active leases for me, which is uh, typically a good, a good security feature. Now, redirect. Uh, there are two classes of redirect uh, that um, modern PFS, the RDR2, which okay, just started to try one piece of tree to configure and do things. Let me work on lab seven. Okay, you, you're probably on that, Tom. Um, now, uh, there are two uh, versions of uh, redirect the RDR2 can go to well, any, any address, local or uh, remote. Divert to is for match and pass rules. Uh, diverts socket 
uh, only for, for local use for configured addresses on that host. So typically your SPAMD, which we'll come back to, passing on egress to port SMTP, uh, the VIR2 port SPAMD, uh, which is slightly quicker for a um, uh, uh, for a local lookup, you know, but you can't use it to uh, to uh, redirect to another host in, in the network, for example. Now, we mentioned FTP, and um, uh, well, um, FTP uh, is older than TCP/IP, um, and it's been well, it's been sort sort of a uh, heartache for uh, network administrators for, for years because it's. It's a complicated protocol to uh, to firewall because it dynamically allocates ports and so forth. But uh, you know, if it enables uh, if you really need uh, FTP, um, you um, yeah. Len has a question. Um, if you want me to speak it out loud, I'm just getting started. Mm -hmm. I did the configuration on page 23 of the lab. Right, yeah. Page 24, it says do the pings. None of the pings work. Okay. Um, Len, uh, can you confirm that you can, can you ping 10.255 to 255 to 254? Uh, so. Sorry for tying up the tutorial. Ping. 10.255.255.254, correct? Yeah. Nope, that hangs. Okay, Peter, do you, uh, if it's okay with you, Peter, can I share my screen? And what I'll do is I'll diagnose the, the lab using uh, lens and people can follow me as if they were doing their own lab. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for that, Chris. Yes. Appreciate all your patience. Okay, so I'm just going to use this. So can everyone see my screen okay there? Yep. Okay, just so I'm going to, Len, what lab are you in? Sorry. Lab seven. Lab seven, excellent. So I'm going to jump <laughs> onto your lab seven firewall first. Oh. I'm just going to have a quick look at what your setup is here. Am I on the firewall? Shoot. Let me just get back to the window. I might be on the wrong host. Lab seven host one. That's the wrong one, isn't it? That'll be sorry, I was just on. <clears throat> so we're in there. I will just go. Okay, so we can just configure. So I go to uh, shout. So uh, if other people can shout what should be, so this is lab seven. So it's internet should be. So if I was just to do this, I'd, um, I'm just gonna go MG slash ETC. What's the name? Tom? Yeah. I think I've solved the problem. I'm on the host, not uh, the firewall. Okay. So, so just it, so uh, if you put the IP address on the firewall, everyone in the in their under firewall, if they put the ten dot two five five dot x slash twenty four, you should be able to ping the local gateway. If you set your default gateway to that, you should be able to ping an, an IP address on the internet. Um, if anyone else is having issues, if you chat uh, with me, I can help uh, assist you with the labs and just uh, keep things moving. Uh, Peter, is there anything you want to demo? If you are, or, or will, will I just go back to the system people in the lab individually? Well, uh, I'm doing just. Well, there will be some exercises after this. But, okay, uh, so I, I'll I'll stop the share. So and. Um, yeah. Anyhow, thank you. That, I think, probably does solve the problem. You're more than welcome. If anyone else wants assistance from me, if you just chat on, on IRC, Max will pass on the message to me, or put it on Zoom, 
uh, if you put the, your request on Zoom, and I will in I will interactively deal with you offline. Yeah. So back to uh, FTP. Well, it has a lot of uh, issues, but we do uh, we do proxy. So we have a what's called FTP proxy, just even for uh, IP version six. Uh, the interesting thing about the uh, FTP proxy really is that it <clears throat> it gives us the um, possibility to to explore anchors, which are named sub rule sets. You can even have anchors. Uh, loaded from separate files if you want. Uh, what um, FTP proxy uses that anchor for is to dynamically update the rules in it. And you know, if you haven't, so it's set up just like in the slide here, you enable the FTP proxy, then add to your pf.com an anchor called exactly that FTP proxy, star afterwards. Um, and that's where uh, FTP proxy uh, handles, the, uh, puts the rules that will handle your FTP traffic. And you um, set up uh, with the uh, pass rules here, passing the quick, uh, quick INET proto TCP to port FTP, divert to, that's the local alert, to 8021, which is where uh, FTP proxy uh, listens. Same thing for uh, INET 6, if you run uh, FTP for INET 6. And then again, you need to pass out TCP from wherever the proxy lives um, to uh, port FTP. That, that's, that's all it takes. There's even reverse mode for when you host FTP servers. All of it is in uh, FTP proxy. That said, uh, if you really, <laughs> If you think you need uh, FTP, uh, think again, see whether you can do file, file transfer a little more securely. But anyway, if you have to, the, the tool to handle FTP is right there in the OpenBSD based system. Now, that's the exercise we we're talking about. Your network grows and you become a gateway. So we extend the configuration to handle network access to the internet. Are we ready for that? Oh, I think you're muted, Tom. Sorry, I think so. I think I think you should be. If they're able to ping uh, the gateway from, they should be, and they have the default route into the gateway. It should work, uh, and I'll be here to support anyone who who needs assistance with the lab. So, guys, uh, people who are on the Zoom channel, if you can just chat to me, you can either direct message or just ask for help, and I will jump on to your lab. Um, or if you want, if anyone wants assistance, I can do a demo of following through the exercise with, um, with your lab, if that helps. Right. So anyway, this is a uh, simplified um, sketch of a network. Actually, I think you probably only have one host in the, in the lab network, but that will pretty much the same. Um, so first thing you do is on your on your gateway, you know, your firewall, you set up the uh, uh, forwarding thing, sysctl net IP, not uh, sysctl uh, net IP forwarding for both uh, INET 6 and uh, version 4. And you add to whatever rule set you had uh, earlier, match out on egress, INET net to egress. Um, so you will also need to um, set up a uh, rule to pass traffic from that local net. Uh, you could have that rule already if you did the pre previous exercise. My my memory is so, sort of um, quick refreshing here. So we pr probably did some of this in the previous exercise gateway. Um, we don't have IP version 6 to it, Tom. No. So uh, just skip the, the first one uh, and go for the uh, uh, go, go for uh, the IP version 4 addresses. Again here, your gateway would have the inner interface in the uh, RFC 1918 range here with the uh, third octet 
corresponding to uh, your uh, the number of your lab. So, and uh, as we we assume two hosts here, but uh, we will just use the uh, the first one. And, and remember to set the uh, the default gateway on on the host to the inner address of the the firewall. And then check whether you can ping from the uh, uh, from the uh, from the host to the to the gateway. And uh, next, ping something out uh, out, out on the internet. If you want, uh, Peter, just to take a brief break, what well, if yeah, can. someone can volunteer their lab? Um, I'll I'll configure it and share the screen with with everyone. Does anyone want to volunteer? I would say let's you can use a... lab seven, which is my I'm lab. You can yeah. use lab seven That's screen sharing then, and you, you just grab it, Tom. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, just trying to grab money. Okay, you can see that. So lab seven, let's going to expand this. Lab seven. So with the console, we're looking at the IP config. You can shout at me if you want. Um, again, I'm just going to escape out of that if that's okay. Uh, Len. Sure, go right ahead. You, I'm not touching the console now. Perfect, thank you. So I'm just going to cast. Zero, so I'm sorry, host name dot VIO zero. So we just want to see, okay, so he's doing I, I net auto config. So I'm just going to set that manually. I'm going to be bold. So I'm going to go. Uh, and I'm going to put I net. And then, so I'm basically adding in the IP address and the route, just doing that. So then we want to check, have we assist CTA? So let's just check the configuration on the uh, the second interface of the firewall. And okay, so there's nothing there. So we're just going to configure that. So we go INET. And then it's 192.168.7, I'm going to presume, guys, call me out if I'm wrong. Uh, 7.1 is it? And then we go and hit. So we've added in that one. So then we just go S. So we're just restarting the network, getting those in. There we go. And we've added in the default gateway. Okay, so then we have to do, so we now want to check and see, do we have forwarding enabled? The CTL pipe space crap. Maybe one thing you want to do, Tom, is make the, the font a little bit bigger in that. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. Sorry, thank you for that. Uh, I'll go to 200%. Is that yeah. better? Does that make uh, it easier? A little bit better. Maybe a little bit more would help as well. No problem. I always get frightened uh, if this. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not scaling from. <laughs> no, it doesn't. You just have to zoom in again. Like, like you just. Okay, there we go. To, oh, oh, there you go. Much better. And I've overdone that slightly. I'll bring her back to 150. Okay. Is that better for everyone? Sorry oh, about that, guys. That's but, very clear. <laughs> okay, perfect. 
So we see here we've got SysCTL and it's it's forwarding is disabled because that's the default, as as Peter was saying. So we just go. Sorry, I'm just going to type. SysCTL net dot ip equals one. And if we want to store that for future, we just go to go. Sorry, I call IP one, and then we put it into So that'll store it in the comp for the future reference. Yeah, so basically well, that, that means it will, will forward after your reboot as well. So. Thanks very much. <laughs> So, um, so now we should be able to ping our, let's ping the gateway. Did yeah. I restart the network? I did, so 10 to 2 for 5, 2 for 5. So I just want to make sure the current uh, path is working fine. Look, looking good so far. Okay, so we're looking okay. We've enabled forwarding. Um, and what we're going to do now is I'm going to jump to uh, la, um is it Len? Sorry, Len, I was calling you Lars. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, I, I'm just going to try and I'll have this. Um, try to get out of full screen on this. Give me one second. Ah, there it is. Sorry about that. And I'm just going to go on to his host. So let's see what we have here. We'll expand it out again. So we're now on his host. And um, so we go, um, uh, let's just see what we have. Okay, so we have, uh, he's done. So we're going to just re-IP this to match the lab. So we go mg slash ec. Okay. So, so I'm just going to put one, six, eight, dot one, uh, seven, dot, I'm going to leave it at seven, that's fine. Um, I want to use this shorthand, and I'm going to put one, eight, seven, dot one. In your case, this would be lab number, dot one. Um, I'll leave, I'm going to leave that as it is. Uh, and leave my good friend and colleague uh, correct that, uh, Max. So we're going to hit Control X, Control C, my favorite editor. Um, and we're just going to restart the network stack on that. So let's see. So I want to make sure that there's no hangover IP address there isn't. So, uh, okay, so now I should be able to ping the gateway locally. 7.1, let's see how we're doing. Okay, so we're pinging that, that's that's nice. And let's see if we can ping um, 10.255 to 245.7, which is the outside interface of the firewall. And we're able to ping that. Now, can anyone ask me, can anyone answer me whether we should be able to ping the lab, the, the main lab server, and anyone want to volunteer an answer to that before I type it in with the current config? Nothing I know you're out there. Here. <laughs> I can hear you breathing. Okay. You? So, so, okay, so it's not pinging. And there's probably either, and the part of the reason for this is if we revert, revert back to my good friend and colleagues notes with the diagram. What pages of the di oh there it is. So we have a firewall somewhere here. Can you all see my mouse? Uh, but there's no route back into your machine. So that's the reason why. So we can use NAT to hide the IP addresses, which is what Peter was just talking about. Uh, so let's just so do that. Need to, need to uh, add your 
I don't add that to your PFL conf. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so that's that's back on the uh, the firewall then. Are all uh, labs on a shared layer too? They are not on a shared. They, you should be all isolated. Uh, so you. So uh, who, who, sorry, who's asking that question? Sorry, was it is it Jan? Is it? Yes. How are you doing, Jan? Um, so uh, you should have your own. Now there may be an issue if if you're having an issue pinging your host. I can take a quick look if you want. Uh, I can. What I might do is give Len a break and let him try and install the, the NASH rule. And I can jump onto your uh, your um, your lab if you want, Jan. Everything is working for me, just asking. Okay, cool. So uh, just for those who are interested, uh, I'll just briefly show, uh, and I'm not good, it's a bit beyond the scope, but if we look at the network, so everyone has their own independent uh, layer two bridge, which is VLAN aware. So you can actually create multiple VLANs and you can do routing and stuff like that within your own lab and you won't affect anyone else. So that's the, that's the actual setup here, okay? Um, or sorry, that's the intended setup. Um, as, so just to be uh, clear. So I might just jump back onto Len's um, machine just to be bold. If that's okay with you, Len? Sure. Okay, Len. So I'm just uh, so let's look at Len's PF to conf. And I'll zoom in on this. Sorry. So it's a pretty much default config. So I'm going to add it in. And so it's pass out on egress from okay, 192. So I want to pass out from the, and I want to not to the actual interface of my public interface, which would be either VIO zero, or I can use, as Peter pointed out, the egress macro. So I'm just going to put uh, not to. I'm going to be lazy there. And I think that should work. So we're passing out on the egress, which is the interface where the default route is currently active. And we're saying from this network, we rewrite the source address. That's what we're doing there. Let's try that. Sorry, let's. Uh... Try the DNS first. Yeah. Yeah. So the more fees you put in, the more verbose it is. And it looks, it looks positive. Looks like it won't break the internet. And so we just drop off the end. So that's a nice way of just pre-proofing -pre -pre your rules as Peter just pointed out. So um, now if we go back to L Len's machine, his host, I'm hoping that it'll start pinging and behaving itself. Let's just see. It ain't. Hold on. Actually, can you expand this as well? Can you zoom in this one as well? All right. Thank you. Okay. So we're <laughs> able to get out as far as there. So that there. works. So that's working, but 254 is not. No. So I'm just going to do a bit of diagnostics there. Going to go back to our his firewall, and I'll recheck my map. The so I'm just back into the firewall, and I just want to see. Well, can I ping it from the firewall here? Oh, sorry, something.
Okay, there's something up here. So I'm just checking the ARP. There's something misbehaving. So I'm just going to do a layer one check here. Uh, literally see if I'm actually in on the correct LAN. And that looks good. Tutor host. Firewall main. Good. Uh, let me just, sorry, I'm, I'm digressing there. Uh, console. I'm just going to go on to my firewall, just make sure everything's tickety-boo here. So if I'll expand it again. So now I'm at the main firewall in the lab. Oh, sorry. There we go. I'm just going to go on to my firewall, just make sure everything's tickety-boo here. So if I'll I'll expand expand it again. So now I'm at the main firewall in the lab. Can anyone who is no. have the live stream all the go on to my sure firewall to make sure everything's tickety-boo here? So if I'll I'll expand expand it again. So now I'm at the main firewall. Okay, I'm just going to mute everyone. Uh, and Peter, can you mute everyone? Can anyone who is yeah. have the live stream yeah, all the main firewall just make sure everything's tickety-boo here? I, th I think I think I am the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, just going to go. Seven. So seven is replying. Okay. Okay. Is anyone else's lab up and running? Jan, what's your lab number again? I have none because I'm playing along on my own Beehive installation. Okay, no problem at all. That's perfect. Uh, okay, let me just, uh, so I can ping his search. Is there a possibility that someone is? Just want to double check this. Everything looks fine. Yeah. We're going to go back to Lars, is she there again? Or Lens, sorry. One second. So who's everything his? Okay, let's see. There's probably an IP, potentially IP conflict. I'm just going to check the Mac here. It's your usual kind of 3AC1. Okay, look, I'm not going to hold you up for now. Uh, I, I'm just going to double check. I'm going to make one quick config change in the lab as a precaution. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand back the reins to my colleague uh, who wants to take the reins from me. And what we'll do is uh, I'm just going to double check something in the lab here. 
in the background? I would suggest we do a, f a five, 10 minute break. Yeah, probably. So we are at the, we are at the mid, mid time. So we're at the one hour and a half. Yeah, so uh, I don't know, five, five minutes to, uh, to refresh mm -hmm. coffee or? <laughs> Perfect. And I'll make that quick tweak. Yep. Right, so see you in five then. Uh, I think, Max, you're probably up next, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yep. Yep.
I think we're we're about five minutes out now. Cool. Right. <laughs> so the next bit is um, about hosting services. Um, Mm. Oh, you ready, Max? Yes, I am. Yes. Um. It's so like um, both, both in the old location and a new one, so <laughs> you can you can go on from. Yeah. Yes, can you share the the slides then? So you have. Yeah, sure. Uh, you you want me to uh, keep doing that? Yeah. Okay. I'll just follow follow along. Um, let's see. There it is. Yeah. So. Yes, so um, we've looked at the, the basics so far. We've looked at uh, you know, setting up the, the basic uh, packet filter, the basic filtering systems. But then um, this is the point where we start looking at what can you do on top of just setting up simple filters? So uh, you want to start enhancing your rules to allow for services to be served internally on your network. And then you have to start taking some decisions. So um, you have to, well, here we say put in writing as a, as a suggestion, um, the services, the ports you want to use, the um, consider etc slash etc services. Uh, there could be the service names already that you can use later on in the, um, in making the rules and then the, the hosts that run the services. And then uh, um, in some environments, you want to restrict where these, um, these uh, services are reachable from and uh, <clears throat> uh, for how long you maybe want to restrict some of these, uh, some of these patterns. So um, th there are also some services that require some extra help uh, proxying. We've seen uh, FTP. Hopefully FTP is uh, slowly dying out, but, uh, but for the moment it's, uh, it's better to keep it in mind. And so OpenBSD comes with some of these proxies by, by default in the, um, in the base system. There's FTP proxy, there's a RelayD, which is very useful for also load balancing, but then there's a particular function that we, we have come up with, um, with the, um, like the, the fact that you could use it to provide IPv6 uh, connectivity in, uh, in areas where you don't have IPv6 behind the proxy. Um, that was one of the uh, parts that we used to also suggest to, to start the migration of IPv6 when, we, when, when I was giving IPv6 training courses. Uh, and then you have SPAMD, um, which is not what you might think of. It's, a, it's not a filter for, uh, for spam, but it's a, it's a way to annoy spammers by putting them in a specific queue and 
uh, uh, using more of their resources. We'll see that in in future slide. Um, there's also squid varnish. There are packages with those. Uh, those are um, more known than relay D, but um, uh, or N engines. Um, there are many other packages you could use, but for now we will uh, focus on what you find in the base system. And then we were mentioning earlier, we, you have to um, take some decisions. One of these is, do you want to set up a uh, DMZ or do you want to keep services in the same subnet as where you as where you have your clients? This depends on on uh, on how you uh, you want to set it up. The suggestion that I would give you is to just do a demilitarized zone, a DMZ, uh, all the time, so you can separate clients and services, and then you can treat the two networks in a different way. Um, uh, a, a demilitarized zone is an area that's separate from the rest of the um, of the clients, from the rest of the um, of the hosts. Um, here we suggest you can have several. Uh, nowadays, um, the easiest way would be to have different VLANs, so you don't have to connect different cables or anything. And uh, consider if you have, in this case, the, the suggestion is if you have multiple customers, um, let's say you have, even, even when you have different web servers, maybe you want to separate them into different smaller um, DMZs, different VLANs. So you uh, logically separate each one of them. You give them a different, um, uh, different um, uh, network. Uh, you, you give them different resources. This way you keep everything separate and then via the centralized firewall, you can manage who can talk to who and uh, you can protect your customers better. So this is an example <clears throat> where you have the central firewall that handles the DMZ on one side, clients on the other. Um, and then you, uh, this way you can easily manage who can talk to who, you can provide uh, services from the public internet directly on the DMZ and vice versa, you can have also clients on your local network access the same services uh, directly over the firewall. So uh, having a DMZ is very much recommended and I will, uh, um, it's, it's part of all the, well, network designs we see uh, around. And uh, so we would suggest using one of these. So going on with the next slide, we start with the, some examples with uh, <clears throat> how we allow some services in. This is an example where we define some uh, variables, some macros. We define where our web server is, which ports it uses, HTTP and HTTPS, where we make a, um, uh, we use the names we find in ETC services. Uh, we define an IP address for the uh, mail server. We define which ports we want to open for the mail server, and then we define which name servers um, are on our network. So as you will, uh, you might have realized 192.0.2 is the network where we have our DMZ. And uh, the rest is, uh, should be in different um, uh, network segments. But then what we do is we define all these variables early on. And then later we say, we just open these ports. We say pass TCP to web server uh, and web server is substituted with the IP address you see above and use those ports and open those ports. Same we do for the mail server. And then we, <clears throat> we log everything uh, from the mail server to the SMTP. And then we allow TCP and UDP to uh, name servers port uh, uh, 53, that's the domain port. Um, keep in mind, we do TCP and, and UDP, even though it's a DNS, because now you have to account for larger responses because of DNSSEC most of the time and uh, DNS keys. So uh, this is a, an important thing that people usually don't consider. Uh, I would suggest doing um, always TCP and UDP for, uh, for DNSs. Um, there is a, uh, there would be an, an example that we have. There's a link on the slides that leads to a, to a config file. Um, 
Peter pasted the address where you can find the slides, but we will paste it later on as well, again, on the in the chat and on IRC. And uh, so next slide. <clears throat> I can go back if you have more here. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, 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 do you want the next slide or should we stay on this bullet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wait a moment. We have a question. Um, how 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 NAT works if block occurs after the NAT rule? So if we go back, actually in this case we're not. Um, are we NAT in there as well? Yeah, we have. Yeah, 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 we do have a NAT. Um, well, you always take the last uh, rule. So that um, that happens when you when you have uh, two web server, blah, 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 plus the well, yeah. again, you're, oh, you're, match you're, last rule. You're, yes. you're, you're, you're natting on, uh, on, the, uh, on out, uh, passing out. On passing the, out your rule. So, um, uh, if I remember correctly, there used to be some differences between different OpenBSD versions and FreeBSD in if after the match not rule, you see the modified packet or the original header. Yes, uh, that's why you should be very careful about, about where you're not. Um, in this config, the NAT happens when um, uh, at, the, at the point of egress. So it only applies to the, the, the traffic you pass out. So basically this one, um, This one allows for the return, but that also allows directly uh, it allows, uh, access to um, to those specific servers. Uh, but any 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 traffic that's produced in in that lo uh, in the lo local networks that this box handles will be natted. So um, it's. Uh, the complete example, I think, has a few more rules to uh, to um, compensate for some of the NAT complexities. I think it's been a couple of years since I looked at it, but it's. Uh... Uh, okay. Um... Uh, the thing is, if you if you have um, services behind NAT. Uh, you will need some uh, some extra gymnastics to to handle the uh, the redirections. So uh, I think that's in in the in the um, complete example. I think these these rules are in, uh, and they are also actually quite well explained in the book of PF. Yeah. Yes. Uh, does that clear up okay. what we Yeah, I was looking for confirmation from Len. It was, Len, you, you still have your hand up. You've, you've had your hand up all the time. So sometimes it's uh, triggering me think, thinking there's a new question. Oh, perfect. Thanks. So did this answer your question or would you have any, any more follow-ups? I think I'll take the silence as as we're good to go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, now, now for the fun parts. That's a chance to now now for the <clears throat> the fun part. Yes, because what we can do is we can uh, you know if if you if you run a server if you run a box that's connected to the internet you will have seen most likely all the brute forcers that try to to log into your SSH. Um, you can take different actions. You could move your SSH port to a different port or anything, but this is just mitigating the effect because they will find out at that point. Um, so what you can do is you can set up a rule to um, basically take all these brute forcers and uh, move them at one point if you see if the if the system sees too many uh, login attempts coming from the same uh, IP address to move them to a table 
that's uh, that's created with that with counters, and then uh, at one point it they will be just uh, um, basically put in a sort of a let's call it a quarantine, and uh, and they will be uh, not able to 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 hammer your SSH port anymore. So this is one way you can. Uh, you can use PF intelligently to uh, tackle some of the issues we all have on, uh, on our servers daily. Another one, the next slide, is uh, uh, tackling with WordPress. Um, WordPress is an example, but this is a way to take, um, <coughs> basically um, take some logs, um, see what's happening to your service and basically do what you could also do with um how's the service uh, how's the software called uh, anyway um basically taking um, all these attempts uh, look at the connection rates look at the numbers and then use tables intelligently to block these people or send them to a different destination so in the next slide we see how this could be done we have uh, we create a table, and we set it to uh, basically we block everything from uh, all the IP addresses included in that table. And now we we get this uh, web port uh, rule. We change it, and we say you know take uh, everything that gets um, uh, gets in that uh, in that table, uh, increase the counters and. Um, and um, keep us keep state with that. Make it, make sure we can. Uh, um, man, how do you say that? And uh, pass everything so that it goes into the into the 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 the, the web roots table if they pass over a certain uh, amount of uh, um, login attempts. Um, you could also do that. Um, on another machine by looking at the logs and uh, counting uh, counting the the uh, the accesses and then filling the table via uh, pfctl adding the uh, ip addresses that you see are uh, are really trying to hammer your uh, wordpress login or uh, your um, in your access logs so this is another way to annoy people who are trying to hammer your um, uh, web server. Next is instead uh, spam, spam D. Sorry, how to annoy spammers. And uh, if you've ever uh, uh, seen the posts that Peter makes on uh, on Twitter, you will, or Twitter or Facebook, you will see that he is always busy in tackling these uh, these spammers. So what you do is uh, you you gray list. You can uh, put them in gray list, but also you can uh, put them into a queue where they are treated very, very slowly. And so what happens is that you uh, will see that in the next slide. There we go. Um, basically, we um, we take a uh, we take a list. We have um, um, we divert the, the traffic by default to um, to a port where this uh, daemon runs. That's SpamD. Um, SpamD keeps track of all the connections coming in um, and either fills the uh, SpamD white table or uh, keeps the uh, connection open with uh, with the spammers to really annoy them. So what happens is the first time someone connects, goes to the goes into the SpamD uh, daemon. SpamD <coughs> uh, checks the uh, tuple, that's the uh, source IP address and the, um, the, um, the 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 destination of the email that's being uh, that's being sent, and uh, then a normal um, client would be just told, okay, there's a temporary failure, retry later. And then once the server retries, it's considered legitimate. 
SPAMD just redirects the traffic to, uh, well, adds the IP address to the SPAMD white uh, table, and then uh, basically redirects the traffic to it. Uh, and so the next, uh, the next uh, iterations when the uh, foreign mail server will try to connect, will go directly into the SPAMD white and will just be forwarded to the SMTP server. In case the server is not really legitimate, it will be treated by SPAMD to a uh, slower and slower response all the time, keeping trying to keep the connection open. So the, the idea behind this is to annoy the spammers by keep using by keeping using their resources all the time. And so uh, Peter has some statistics about how long some spam uh, some spam uh, processes has, uh, have been kept on. Uh, days, weeks, was yeah. it weeks? Yeah, I, th I think I think the uh, the longest one I saw was several weeks. Yes, uh, and uh, one byte at a time. So it's yes. well, one, one one byte per second. So it's uh, uh, but the your your typical blacklist um, uh, spammer will hang around for anything. Uh, um, three to five minutes is the is the default. Not um, not being able to to deliver the message ever. So, uh, and, and they can stay blacklisted for, I don't know, months at a time. <laughs> there's, there's another very useful point, which, you know, you're subtly touching on it, but let's say if there's worm activity or ransomware activity on a network, if you can identify these and, and these bots and hold them, you're, while your host might be immune to the attack, the next host up or 10 hosts IPs up might be vulnerable. And by holding them in that connection, you can actually slow down the propagation of, um, you know, spam is, you know, is, is annoying, but it is one of the, like, it can be very useful in slowing down um, the thread and, and buying you additional time to make sure all the rest of your hosts in your block are, are, are impervious to whatever attack you're trying to thwart. Just to uh, just to close off on the last exercise, there was an IP conflict. Uh, there was another VM with the same IP address, and so the traffic was being black hole there. So the lab is actually working, thankfully, eventually. Uh, but it's like everything; you have to just diagnose it and uh, start with layer one and work upwards. You know. Anyway, I'll hand back to Max. Sorry about that. Uh, no, no problem. That's uh, that's useful information, so we can. Uh... Because soon now we'll have another um, exercise, so it's good that we we all get to to know there's a, there's an exercise there's a, everything's fine in the labs. So, um, is there any successor for the BGP Spamdy project? Um, not that I know of. I'm not, I'm not sure anything happened. Uh, with that project for quite a while, uh, we will need to uh, uh, need to pro um, uh, poke Peter about it at some point. Peter Hasler. There is a similar thing, not aimed uh, specifically at um, at um, SMTP, um, but there is a similar so service to basically uh, it's an anti DDoS service, but just the point is, there's a very similar service that's run by Team Camry. Um, I can write; it's called UTRS. Uh, I can write the uh, the link later on. Um, that's a, that's a similar service, not aimed at email, but aimed at uh, at helping with uh, DDoS uh, attacks. So you can announce your prefix you want to black hole, um, but that's not exactly the same thing as I mentioned, but similar concept in service. And I, as I, um, the way I know it, there is no successor to to that, to the BGP uh, SPAMD service. Although um, we could think about setting one up. Uh, again, I, I can ask Peter about the, the configs, um, maybe see if we, can, uh, if we can run one for fun again. Yeah. Sign me up. Right. <laughs> okay, next. So um, we can al also have a um, 
protection from um, against uh, uh, sin floods and uh, sin cookies. In this case, um, you can enable the uh, that by um, uh, setting sin cookies on, and uh, um, you can also set it up to be adaptive. As an example here, um, so say. Uh, um, reach uh, reach a certain percentage until the end level is reached. So in this case, the example is 29% and 15%. Um, that's an example of how you could configure that. Um, so far, personally, I've only just set it to on, and that was it. I've never played with, uh, with percentages. And I wouldn't know if this is a normal percentage to use on a public service or not. But maybe Peter can tell us a bit more here. I'm trying to remember where that uh, where those values came from. Uh, I think it was somebody uh, an email exchange with somebody who's playing with it, and they said, "Okay, this this is what I ended up with. It looks looks fine now. It, I uh, I survived the whatever scale attack using this. So I, yeah, well, it's in the mailbox somewhere." <laughs> Yeah, it will be somewhere. So, okay, so next slide. Um, <clears throat> we've mentioned, I've already spoken about the uh, DMZ. Um, my suggestion is um, to separate uh, uh, completely, have completely separate address ranges for the different segments of, the, of your networks. This makes things much easier. You don't have to uh, then um, not internally, or but it also helps in in segmenting everything separately. I would suggest using VLANs um, nowadays because you can all, every switch you can buy even the cheap Microtix just do VLANs pretty well, and uh, <clears throat> and then start by by writing down what you need, what you what uh, services you you run, and then start going one by one. Um, and behind me, you can see there's a whiteboard. It's a big whiteboard. I, I'm not going to show you what's on the whiteboard, but I suggest getting one to use in, uh, in, your, uh, in your environment to start writing down the rules and, uh, and showing what uh, and discussing what, uh, what needs to be filtered or not. Or simple paper would be also okay, but uh, whiteboards really help, uh, at least in my case, when, when I need to think about uh, and plan things. So um, plan according to, to uh, also the traffic you, you would like to have in and out. And this is most important nowadays because what you will be, what you're facing most of the time is you have uh, connections that are bigger or have more bandwidth than in some cases your hardware can handle. And, uh, or, um, Especially now, I, I, I am in Switzerland here. We have ISPs who give you 10 gigabit connections, 25 gigabits. And then so you have to plan according to, to what you want to have there. Um, so it, it, really, it, really, uh, it really is a, uh, a race to, to, go, to go more than, uh, than what you know, our computers can handle nowadays. I see some some ISPs around here are discussing about going to 40 gigs. So that's also something to keep in mind. And then uh, renumbering is always a bad word because it involves a lot of uh, a lot of work. So um, hopefully consider. I, I it just happened, but today I was using my IPv6 mug and consider using IPv6 as a base and then. Um, one suggestion is you can use um, RealAD or even, even just PF, and we'll probably see it also in the exercise later, to, you could have a, an IPv6 only network behind it and have RealAD answer with IPv4 and redirecting all your connections to IPv6. <coughs> Normally, you would hear that Cloudflare does the other way around. Cloudflare has... IPv6 and IPv4, and then you have just an IPv4 uh, host behind it, um, and Cloudflare caches your content from the IPv4-only host and provides v4 and v6. Here we can do the opposite. You could have v4 on the 
um, on the relay and have just IPv6 internal to your network. So you would have to manage just one protocol. And that's what we have uh, recommended for a long time when I was at, uh, at Ripen CC. So next slide. Do we have any remaining questions for the for this section? Because otherwise we have an exercise and I think we can start doing just the exercise and then see if any question comes in. So I don't see any question on IRC either. So the goal is we now have services. So uh, we can set up HTTP and SMTP, just opening the, um, the, the, the services will be enough where we, we're not going to put any WordPress or uh, or any uh, detailed SMTP service here. We just try to open them up, see if we can uh, uh, talk to them. So we need to set up the services. We need to set up redirects and some firewalling groups. So how do we do this? This is the, uh, again, the setup with the DMZ. We will have the set, uh, um, uh, services set up in the DMZ. So it's a separate, slightly separate network. And so the first thing we need to do is to start HTTPD. And then here, maybe Tom, you can we can show how how we do that. Okay. Um, so thanks very much. I just wanted to add to seeing as there was no questions. Just even in the spirit of not being an IPv6 enthusiast, I will say that if you actually set up your network with IPv6, you have a huge advantage with huge IP ranges, and you don't have to concern and you can route everything and it is quite nice. And so in that way, you can actually have a really nice architecture built out for yourself in V6 and then conserve your IPs in the constrained V4 space. So I will say that that's actually an approach that we've had to do, let's say with V4, like using lots of private and CG NAT space, but in a constrained IP uh, V4. And it, it means that you're often trying to hack just to keep the IP address space uh, going so I just wanted to just add to that. Thanks very much, Max. I'll will I share screen and uh, we'll do that. So let's. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Then I'll leave it to you. Okay, cool. Perfect. I'll just share my screen. Sorry. Don't be shy about asking questions as well. Uh, that's the main reason we are here and actually i pretty much enjoy when there are questions because then we can we can it's also a chance for for the uh, the three of us who are giving the, the this tutorial to learn something sometimes you you make people think make us think okay. so i'm now on just on my uh the the actual teacher box so I go to so we're going to just set up a HTTP service here. So the handiest way of doing it, and it's mentioned in the slides, is just use the examples that are there. So if we just go CP slash so etc examples httpd.com, okay, and then we go to slash etc. So let's just edit the default one there. And you'll see there's a whole break of, so you can re replace example.com. You can leave it there, it's, it's fine, it'll still work. Uh, you'll also see this ACME challenge. Does anyone know what that is? Any, what did the audience want to tell me about that? No, I know you're right. Uh, that's for, for the um, uh, Less Encrypt uh, 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 certificate handling. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. And so I'm just going to go control this. I may be missing the brace, but let's just see. So in uh, OpenBSD, if you want to enable a service, just RCCTL, enable. And then you go RCCTL start. This is going to complain that I'm missing a brace somewhere. Oh, it's not. Oh, joy. Okay. So then, okay, so we have it, it's actually functioning. Um, this firewall is pretty restrictive. Can anyone tell me what I would need to do to allow it to serve HTTP pages? Anyone? 
God, I miss in-person conferences. Uh, uh, so you have to uh, allow incoming connections on port 80. Nice one, yeah. Internal interface. You get a beer but, the next time I see you. But it's 50% 50, 50 of the answer. That's not only port 80. Port 80. 443? And 443, exactly. Well, uh, Tom not has to removed the... serving anything at all. The yeah, yeah, challenge yeah. will complete over HTTP. True. That's true. What That's happens true. Uh, if you don't have a, a certificate yet? And there is no server block for uh, HTTPS yet. I, th I think the idea is the overlords get to see what we, we do, but not the criminals. <laughs> sure, but uh, right now there is no server block bound to uh, HTTPS. Uh, that, that's correct. So, so, so there's no so point in like an opening port 443. No, 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 yeah, but I think what was... Uh, was uh, Max was saying for a general web purpose. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, you're right. I think uh, so. Okay, so we have to add in the firewall. So let's look at that one. So we go mg slash cpf.conf. I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it just makes life easier for everyone. Uh, and I'm just going to dump it in here above, below pass. Any objections, please let me know. Uh, so we just go uh, pass in. From passing proto, sorry, ECP to port to self. I think you can put self in brackets. Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone. Uh, to self. Why do you think I'm putting in self? Or what do you think self means? Anyone? No, you're out there. I can hear you breathing. I'll have to IP as the machine? Yeah, exactly. It's all it's the IP. A, it's a keyword in PF, and it expands to any local addresses. And if put in uh, uh, braces, then it's uh, dynamically expanded. To self port 80. So, yeah, exactly. Thank you very much, Jan. Well done on that. So, uh, and now I'm going to just go Control X, Control C. If you have a router with lots of VLANs, this can get problematic because uh, if you statically expand it, it explodes your uh, actually loaded rule set. If you work around that, you can use it in the definition of a table. That is. A uh, table with your expected set of local addresses. Yeah, that's, that's quite a useful technique. Uh, yeah. And, and I've run into the performance issues with that, you know, where you actually have just thousands of rules that I think, I think Peter had mentioned that, that the tables and uh, was a much more succinct way or compact way of dealing with it. So guys, what you're seeing here, are we seeing the rules there? Let's just see. Oh yes, you see it here. Do we see it? I don't, I'm actually not seeing it. Hold up. There might be some optimizations going on here. I'm going to be cheeky. I'm just going to cut the rest of the config for now. This should be fine. So this is an idea. This is a point where. Pass out. Let me just see that again, sorry. Oh, sorry, there's a comment. This is where <laughs> there was a comment in front. No, that's not it, sorry. Did I kill it? Okay, sorry, I'll just do it again. Pass in praise the lord and there you see it expanding here 
the rule six, seven, eight. And so that's looking like it'll take. So I'm just going to accept that. And uh, so it's already started. So you should be able to actually open up that web page or tell this to my server on port 80. Um, can anyone tell me a web client by default in OpenBSD that's on the command line? W3C, uh, but you, you would have to install it, I guess, or links. Yeah. You can do you can do uh telnet. No, just tell telnet to support. Uh, thank you. You can also use the FTP command as well, but that just like pulls the page down to a file as well. But just yeah, no, I, I was just asking out of uh a curiosity, not necessarily having the full answer myself. We we, we used to have links in the base system, but uh, I think uh, somebody decided it was uh, too much work to keep uh, keep updated. So <laughs> Okay, so uh, maybe the installment media was full. <laughs> I, so I go to turn this into a mail server as well. Uh, just again, it's very simple. If we go, if you want to know what daemons are listening on your box, handy little tool. Uh, ls this ls started. So it tells you all the daemons that are running. Um, or I think enabled as well. No, it's not. Sorry. I see that's what happened. E B L E actually, sorry. No, it's not there. Okay, so LS started. So you can see there that there is actually SMTPD. So by default, um part of the OpenBSD security approach. you'll find that it's listening only on the loopback. So if you want to listen at all, you just have to put in, I think you could just go, there we can return that, we have to restart that. That's done. And then we also, will that accept mail straight off the bat? Again, again, that depends on your rule set. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Apple for Peter later on. So it's just gonna, sometimes it's actually quicker just to type rather than looking for the command in the up arrow, but anyway. So pass in quick proto TCP to, I'm just gonna actually put my address, the internal address, 10, I think five, five, two, five, two, five, four, and then go to, we've already that port. Almost. That, 25. Now, um, just to be, so we're saying pass a quick, so we want to just to accept it fully and not process any further rules protocol TCP to the server on the destination port 25. Okay, um, and I'm going to just edit that. And then again, like everything, we double check the rule set, we parse it. Does it look like it right? It does we look right. We have a question. Yeah, hit us with it. Is it better practice to use quick rules or follow the last match precedents for services? Um, do you mind if I give an opinion on that? And I and I would welcome contradictions from my fellow colleagues. And uh, it, it depends. Quick is really, I would say, on a high volume system. Quick, if you are. If, Efficient rule sets are, are key, right? If you want to block the old the internet, let's say the IPv4, you can put 4 billion rules in and then put in the drop. And, you know, having 4 billion quick rules doesn't really make all kinds of sense. So in terms of efficiency, what you want is that 
your most heavily used rules. So for instance, on a web server or on a mail server, I would put um, accept quick in fairly high up from trusted sources. Um, and so that it would be processing them quicker than, uh, so from my point of view, quick is useful in that scenario. However, if you want to process and do multiple things, like if you want to label uh, label different, uh, like match rules and put labels and stuff, then the quick might necessarily uh, um, help you with using multiple rules on the, um, on on the on the on the actual rule set. So, for instance, if you wanted to log a particular packet or something. Um, but for me, if you're coming from the IP tables, it's actually a slide that didn't make it in. But if you're coming from the IP tables world, uh, Quick is your friend because it'll now behave more like an IP tables rule set. Um, in fact, the FW builder from years ago from Mike Horn um, Net Citadel. They had like this piece of software that would do ASA rule sets, HP firewall rule sets, IP tables, and packet filter. And the way they dealt with packet filter rule sets was, oh, just insert quick everywhere. And so it would construct the rule set based on what it, it you know, because the guys probably were more used to Linux. Um, so that that's my my opinion. And but generally, like when you're what you'll find is sometimes you need to optimize your rule sets because of the load your firewall is experiencing. And, and, and that way, the quick on the heavily used rules is really good. Having it, oh, by the way, quick up at the top, not necessarily down at the bottom of 4 million rules. And I will pass back to my good friends and colleagues who might have more wisdom for it. No, I, I perfectly uh, agree with with your point. Um, yeah, there, there as long are. as you have a small a small rule set, that doesn't make much of a difference. Or, or a rule that's used more than others. And on, and on the other hand, if you have something that you know will be hit very often, you can just have it in quick so that you just match it done, and then the the the, the 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 like the the lookup will not uh, will not spend any any other time going through all the rest of the rules. So it is it is more efficient if you treat it if it, if you treat it well and according to how things should be. As as an antidote, our uh, antidote. Sorry about uh, one thing is I like it about going to BSD can in person is you get to meet the people who wrote the software. Um, and talking to Peter, or not Peter, um, Henning Brower, who's a very entertaining character. I asked him about it. I said, what's the dealio with, you know, processing the last room first? And he said, you know, he got, you know, over a drink, we were just chatting. He goes, you know, I do regret that decision. That, you know, but it was, there was, there was, you know, it was what people were used to with the IPFW. Um, yes, and, and I, think, I think Henning's comment was, um, you know, um, IPF was written by, by an Australian, so everything was upside down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, well, um, nobody's actually quite sure why uh, last match uh, wins was, uh, was chosen by, uh, by the, the author of IPF. But as uh, Tom said here, that, that was what people were used to, and you didn't really want to break existing uh, configs, at least not that much so and uh but then again in testing uh first match wins is usually more efficient yeah so okay i'm going to stop the share i think is there any questions about just what i was doing there i will also see that we're uh we're running out of time this is okay. slides uh, we're, we're a bit over full on slides really for you know, for just a half day session uh, there, there will be your BSD con one where we have a full day. <laughs> so um, um, uh, next up in the original program is about traffic shaping. Uh, I am wondering whether we should use the last half hour or so uh, on the uh, troubleshooting instead. What do you What do you think? 
show of hands. I would go for I would go for traffic shaping because I think this is this can be an important feature. And then if we we can spend five ten minutes also to go with the with the troubleshooting after that. And then yes. we can skip the NAT64 exercise because I know not everyone likes IPv6 as much as I do. <laughs> yes, okay. I'll, I'll grab back the, the screen then for, uh, for, for the slides. Uh, which one was, was we, um, were, were we saying to do the traffic shaping? Was I the one or? I probably was. Anyway, so you can see my screen now. Um, traffic shaping, um, it has a long history. Um, what happened in uh, OpenBSD uh, 5.5 was uh, we got a totally new um, uh, traffic shaping system with queues. Uh, the historical old queue was uh, trying to implement a number of different um, uh, traffic shaping uh, uh, algorithms uh, turned out that well, Henning Henning Broward decided that actually you can you could um, uh, express all, all of the implemented and alt queue uh, disciplines in in, um, uh, in, in one, one of the um, uh, algorithms called uh, um, HFSC. But anyway, this basis of, of traffic JPN OPSD we have on every uh, 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 connection, we have priorities, we, which you can manipulate since OpenBSD 5.0. The queues were introduced in 5.5 and in OpenBSD 6.2, there is a separate algorithm called FQ Codel, uh, which emphasizes fair sharing of, of bandwidth. Now, the important things to remember about traffic shaping is it's really there for, for uh, optimizing your traffic on bad links. So the better, better your link, it, the link is, the less use you have for it. And starting point is you decide whether to drop packets to get people to back off. Um, well, again, if your bandwidth is good enough, you probably just don't care because the, the traffic will get there anyway. And one important thing to, to remember is that you can really only shape traffic that originates in your own network. So, oh, where's my cursor? So, with priorities, the very basic thing is um, well, we have seven, uh, eight different uh, values. They go from zero, which is garbage, uh, through the to seven, which is uh high, highest priority but only really only used for uh administrative traffic um the default for most traffic is three now say you want to prioritize uh, prioritize some service like ssh you do something like in this rule pass proto tcp2 port ssh set prior six that means well ssh gets higher priority uh, and well, you can play with priorities on on, on other uh, on other services uh, to your heart's desire. Um, you can also use prio to um, beat the uh, for, first in for, first out uh, the default discipline. Um, basically, packets that come in are served on a first. Uh, first come, first serve. Then again, in TCP, uh, you have the ACK packets uh, that need to be sent back within a reasonable time. Otherwise, the packet is considered lost. So you would have retransmits and basically fuck up your uh, your bandwidth usage. So, uh, given that the ACKs are tiny and the trap services at the low delay, uh, you could do stuff like what is in the uh, in the rules here, where if you give two priorities, TCP acts with no data payload and packets which have TOS of load label will uh, assigned to the second one. In our case, seven. Packets with a higher priority number are processed first, and packets with the same priority are processed in the order in which they are received. Um, 
there is a relatively old example uh, on that link. Uh, it was tested by the Hotwire. It actually speak on a fairly congested um, ADSL link. It helped downloads quite a lot. So it's a useful trick to have um, have in mind when, uh, well, especially, especially for for quite bad links. Um, FQ Codel was introduced in 6.2. Um, this uh, is what. Well, the people who wrote, wrote that one uh, were talking about buffer bloat, like you, where you have some, um, uh, you, you have, a, have a problem that uh, different clients are, are not being, being served, um, served properly. Uh, so you set up uh, for fair sharing with a, uh, for a, the estimated number of simultaneously active uh, uh, session and um, set off your uh, bandwidth that will be shared uh, according to the, the fair bandwidth sharing algorithm on, on that interface. I'm afraid I haven't played much with it myself because uh, at one point the, the links I worked with were not just good enough. <laughs> um, the uh, possibly more interesting uh, uh, algorithm, HFSC, um, is about uh, sli slicing a bandwidth into predefined size, which can be flexible if you let them. Now, uh, you can have static uh, shaping, um, give bandwidth and absolute values. Uh, you set up a tree, really, of, uh, of queues. Uh, and the thing about HFSC is that only if traffic for some, uh, some queue um, uh, Q definition uh, reaches uh, or pro approaches saturation, no, no actual shaping will take place. So a very basic uh, example here is you set up a Q on a specific uh, interface with a defined bandwidth. This needs to be uh, somewhat less than your, uh, uh, your raw, ba raw bandwidth. Um, uh, I never came, came up with a good formula for, for how much less, but less anyway, right? Because there's, a, there's always some, some overhead. And you define sub queues with hopefully the scr um, uh, uh, descriptive names. Def cube is the, for the default. You have uh, with very, various queues for the various services you want, want to serve. Um, and then you tie this into your rule set with typically, with, if you haven't have a rule set that doesn't have shaping uh, uh, to, to begin with, you can tie it in with match rules like these ones. And the first one here has a variation on the uh, priorities trick uh, for SSH here. Uh, and after this, you would then have uh, whatever your password block rules. Um, so you can uh, have uh, match rules here, or uh, or you can uh, append a set queue to individual pass rules uh, later in your in your rule set. Um, you can even build in flexibility. You know, this is a vari variation of the, uh, the the earlier one here, uh, where we have the uh, the root queue uh, is uh, <coughs> as a uh, uh, defined bandwidth, which can be scaled down to a certain value or max the a, equal to the defined value with a queue limit of a number of packets held in the queue before uh, awaiting a, a drop or pass decision. The next one has a similar um, fle flexible um, uh, allocation. And uh, for some, um, some services like DNS, you can uh, you can have a very low allocation to uh, uh, for for defaults. But you can have bursts for up to whatever number of uh, milliseconds for well when when you actually need that that much uh, activity to, to get get your uh, network comfortable. Now the last one is the special queue for SpamD, where we have um, basically set up the smallest uh, amount of 
a small, smallest amount of uh, available bandwidth uh, measurable, pro even so, is, is even so small that it's probably not being strictly enforced. But we introduced ma maximum latency uh, with, uh, with the max number of uh, packets held in the queue. So, um, uh, well, this is a fairly, fairly complex, uh, well, po uh, potentially complex and, and extremely flexible way of uh, allocating bandwidth where, uh, where, where there uh, is possible scarcity of bandwidth. Um, now, Sysdat is very useful for uh, for a number of things. Uh, the OpenBSD version has, in addition to what the other BSDs have, a live live view of your queues if uh, if you have defined them so this is um uh, this was a snapshot of something uh, on my gateway some years back where you can see that uh, the mo most of the traffic here pass passes in the uh in the default queue as um uh, as anticipated and you can see that the little queue there is the little queue for spam d is almost full so um so um, objective uh, achieved. Another one to launch your queues is uh, using PFCTL uh, BSQ or more of these for more detail. Uh, so you get the raw data here on what your what your queue allocation does. Um, yeah. So any questions on these things? Can I interrupt you for one second, Peter? Just. Um, Jan had made a point about FQ Codel being a very good way on large internet pipes to to equalize bandwidth without having buffer bloat, which obviously yeah. can increase hugely uh, latency. So it was just one of the key advantages of, let's say, why FQ Codel uh, is quite a useful uh, bandwidth, let's say, sharing or equalization. Uh, yes. So it's, it's busy on it's useful on busy pipes in the event of. Uh, moments of congestion. Um, yes, yes, yeah. uh, but sorry, and uh, open up the floor. Thanks. Yeah, so do we have anything on the IRC? Yeah. Do you have any recommendations how to deal with verbal bandwidth links like point-to-point um, -point wireless uh, uplink? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? So, um, do you have any recommendations how to deal with uh, unknown uplink capacities? For example, uh, I'm a member of a hack space and our internet connection arrives via a 1.5 kilometer Wi-Fi link. Oh. And uh, our uplink speed depends on weather conditions. Oh, okay. Um... And so I can't uh, know ahead of time the link capacity to shape. And so far, the best thing I've found is, is a simple priority scheduler. I would think so, yes. Is there uh, anything better we could do? Well, in, uh, well the thing is, the, the way uh, traffic shaping works in, in OpenBSD, you, uh, uh, you kind of have to uh, have a number to, uh, 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 to start with for expected bandwidth. So I, in the, describe, uh, the scenario you describe, I think I would go for priorities, just the pure priorities. One other thing I, I've come across, let's say with wireless links, is where you can adjust, depending on the relative congestion, if I could say. So let's say if you'd, you know, you have a large link, but you have a large amount of bandwidth on it, um, or even a number of heavy users, is that reducing the queue size for each individual queue down from 50 packets down means that you will actually benefit people from who are just doing sporadic kind of connections and stuff like that, uh, rather than just... Um, uh, uh, and also FQ Codel, because of the way, it, you know, it... it, it if you're if you're equalizing on so if you're allowing people to fill 50 packets of 50 packets of buffer uh, before you start dropping so once the 50 packet buffer is queued up uh, you'll start dropping packets uh, so uh, one of the things we found is that being able to reduce that packet buffer at that queue size mm -hmm. can mean that bandwidth hogs can be limited 
while your your nor, your relic regular users experience or the quality of experience uh, improves dramatically. So that's just one option there is that that uh, is in that in, in that queue. But again, you do have to with a variable. You, you you do have to uh, you have to be conservative if you want to guarantee bandwidth space. Um, uh, you know so. But it's also important to point out that all these queues only really come into effect when there's actual congestion. If there, if you keep emptying those fifty packet queues, like I said, if there's sufficient bandwidth available, they'd actually never come into play anyway. It's only when when uh, when you're uh, bordering on uh, uh, congestion that's when when things kick in. So. Any further questions? I don't see any questions on IRC. I don't see any other questions here in the chat. So right. I think we have so a chance we can to go ahead and move on. Uh, the exercise, I don't think we have time for an exercise in this, but uh, of course, every, everyone is free to, <laughs> to do what We will keep the labs up afterwards, so for, for probably a day or so. So you're welcome to play, play around with this. For people who are joining late, if you go to labs.pftutorial.net, choose a lab number, lab one to 19, and then uh, the password is the capital B, capital S, capital D, pass, capital P for password, and then an exclamation mark at the end. So it's capital uh, BSD, capital P, password, lowercase password, sorry, exclamation mark. Anyway, uh, just to, for people who are late, because I just saw some mails coming in about how to connect. Um, okay, so uh, this is on to me, and I'm going to allow you, I'm going to uh, let you be the, uh, the, you move the slides if that's okay, Peter, and I'll just uh, narrate. Uh, so for this tips, uh, so choose your ISP. Like if you're choosing, if you're an enterprise and you're trying to choose your ISP or you're a small ISP, choose another ISP. A, a really good indicator is uh, whether they're a member of a regional internet exchange or a number of them. And do they have geographic redundancy or is it on all the pipes coming out of the capital city in your respective country? Um, and do the other side questions about peering, routing, and multiple paths. So this is obvious, this is a key point for any ISP. And I will safely say that for me, in my journey as becoming a small ASP to bridging the digital divide was actually it was only when joining the local internet exchange INEX that you really kind of got a feel for uh, what real internet routing was and what was involved. And I really do appreciate the, the work that the people in INEX do, uh, phenomenal team there. And, and just by joining, and if there isn't an IXP in your country, then have a chat with Max, have a chat with Peter, um, me, we, we can, there is, but, but, you know, an IXP in your country is a very good thing. Uh, and making the IXP in your country, if it's small, bigger and more accessible is a very good thing. Um, and if you don't have an IXP, you know, the Internet Society and people like that will help out. Um, uh, sorry, can you move to the next slide? Sorry. Uh, so if you're getting transit, uh, you know, not all transit was ever created equal. Um, and there's different transit providers have different techniques. Some people like to do hot potato routing, which is, you know, where they don't really like using their own backbone and like to try and just offload it quickly. Um, and having your, you know, being able to select a transit provider based on your your traffic destination, you can actually really optimize the experience for your customers. So if you have it, for instance, there are some larger providers uh, that tend to try and route things basically, trombone maybe stateside if you're in Europe. Uh, and this can mean that you are adding 50 or 100 milliseconds to, to your actual users uh, ping times, as opposed to doing a hot potato route where you get local uh, distribution where you know, where you want to effectively bring the services closer to your user. And you don't want to be rooting them halfway around the planet. Um, you know, there's also privacy implications there. So that's a key point in selecting your transit. If you can hit the next one, sorry there. Nice. 
Uh, common mistakes, no diversity. Now, having said that, most small ISPs have started up, no diversity. It's all over the same cable. Uh, we have seen the issues in Ireland where there was a, a scheduled maintenance of one major piece of fibre. And I think a couple of hours beforehand, someone put an anchor through the other fibre. So the scheduled maintenance occurred as scheduled, but it ended up cutting off a lot of people. And what you can often find as well, and this is just a pitfall, and Max and Peter, please do chime in. You can have a lot of, you can have redundancy on IP layer, but then you can have an optical networks depending on the same optical provider and when the undersea cable gets hit, it can have devastating consequences. And of course, that's all abstracted away from you. You've no real wave. Uh, and so it's, I would encourage you, particularly as you grow, is to kind of challenge your provider with a, a, a diversity map or a map that shows that where your infrastructure, because there isn't, if you're trying to get diversity or redundancy, there's very little point in using the actual same piece of fiber on two providers that you could be doing because of, you know, with the advances of such as DWDM and stuff like that. There's multiple people sharing multiple infrastructure. That's great for choice, but not great for redundancy. Um, and what else can I say? Signing up too many transit providers, lots of small circuits. Yeah, that's a big thing. You know, you always want to try and you size the problem, you size yourself to your problem. But if it was me and Max, please uh, correct me uh, or Peter, you know, local internet exchange is mandatory. And then another one or two internet exchanges nearby is very useful. And then obviously having your two transit providers. But having more than two transit providers, uh, what I would say is if you're looking for better bandwidth or better quality, look to another internet exchange for diversity, for quality, as opposed to a third transit provider. Um, and so, back, sorry, yes? If you're running IPv6 already uh, and you are not yet peered with uh, how can Electric get in touch with them? They're the internet's largest peering bitch. Yeah, that's true. The 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 uh, the Hurricane Electric do have the largest uh, IPv6 network uh, um, for a long time, um, and uh, and to be fair, I find them quite approachable. Uh, uh, you know, they, but sometimes there's a bit of trombone. You know, there is a bit of that. Uh, no disrespect to anyone, uh, like. It, it, people save traffic for different reasons and usually they're just trying to it's technical people trying to utilize the resources they have as best they can but sometimes and, yep another thing you can do is uh, if your uh, system support uh, NAT64 and DNS64 you can use your cheap IPv6 uh, peerings to uh, tunnel traffic through them to some uh, fast and affordable drop-off point. Oh, I, well, now that's a nice trick. Uh, I'm not so much into the natting, but I, I, I do like routing the traffic, but I think you could probably achieve that. Uh, you know, uh, I, the, I've heard some people use the so, uh, IPv6 tunnels with uh, V4. The nice traffic. thing about this is you don't have to use any tunneling. You route via IPv6 to your and not 64 box and that's the only stateful or at least uh nothing device i get you okay. because uh the dns resolver will take care of pointing you to the right uh not 64 termination point okay thank you very much for that jan uh can we get the next slide there please Open BGBD, oh, this is one of my favorite topics. And if you hang on a bit, uh, me and Max will, will talk about Open BGBD a tiny little bit. Although Max is going to try and talk about Bird, and I'll try and interrupt him as much as I can. And, uh, but uh, Open BGBD is the uh, Open BSD's BGB David, um, and it can interact with PF. It, it can actually, one of the things about BGB is it, it's, it's signaling protocol. It's not just routing, it can actually provide information about the routes. It's it's the routes, and I put routes in inverted commas. So you can say, you could classify, for instance, spammers. You can classify WordPress brute forcers. 
uh, my SQLs, phone dialers. You can you can classify different threat actors or as some security professionals, IOCs, and you can distribute that between firewalls using BGP. And so you can have a real-time kind of almost uh, defense mechanism in, in play. And, you know, some of the larger providers do offer this as obviously a very expensive service and obviously some security providers do it. But you can actually implement your own whole brew of it. So if you have failed to ban running somewhere, you can actually put that into BGPD and then distribute that to all your other PF boxes on the network. And it's it's a phenomenal, uh, it's, it's really cool. Uh, and, you know, the PF table uh, attributes of bgbd.com, that's really where you need to be looking at. Um, and if we had a day or two for a tutorial, then that would be the kind of, they're the kind of labs that, that uh, are awesome. So, uh, but, it, but it is a really good feature. Um, and I know Peter, I watch Peter's blog post because he often talks about the Hail Mary uh, uh, type of uh, brute forcers uh, and he regularly uses this. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, and you can put the honeypots uh, at the upper and lower ends of your address point to pre-populate your uh, deny lists. That is, that is true. And if you want to be really fancy, you could actually push all the bad traffic then into a different routing domain and then try and analyze that further. And that's for the people who have too much time in their hands and don't have, uh, you know, <laughs> but, but it is something that you can do. It's not just block the traffic, but kind of go, how actively are they probing my network? And you can actually effectively route them into a separate kind of like, like a honey network of, which is ultimate, ultimately meaningless in, in terms of that it's not a threat to your network, but you're actually getting more understanding about what's happening. So it is useful for research purposes. Um, just in terms of use cases for OSPF, BGBD, BGB, and uh, EC, uh, equal cost multipath routing. In terms of BGP, look, it's an internet scalable uh, type protocol. Um, it's an exterior gateway protocol and it can be used, as I said, for signaling and adding additional information. OSPF is more for internal uh, internal networking, but it doesn't scale quite as large as BGP. But what it does have is obviously the ability to uh, fail over based on link state. So it is quite a nice way of adding redundancy into your network. BGP can do that as well. But you have to use some other David like if D or uh, um, uh, I'm going to say it, BFD uh, as well to try and validate whether the links are up. Uh, yes. Are there good uh, BFD uh, demons available from ports? Because as far as I know, the base system demons still lack BFD support. Uh, or did that make it in? I think there is BFD support. I can't so, look. I, I, I can't. It used to be that you had to run something like Keep Alive D or something. Um, I'll come back to you on that. Is that okay? Yeah. But, be, but as far as I know, there is sure. payments in, in base as well. So uh, and I know that I know that uh, Claudio was working on on that for uh, BGP as well, as far, if I recall correctly. Um, but yeah, so like it, like one of the things is if you want to use BGP for multi-path routing or redundancy, uh, you know the timers. It's it, you know it's great for stable networks and signaling, but if you want to let's say if you have links that fail over or tend to fail over like tunnels across the internet and stuff like that, OSPF can give you that little bit of a quicker uh, 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 quicker failover. Uh, equal cost multi-path routing. That's a very useful way of um, increasing your bandwidth without having to upgrade your equipment. So you can literally put in two destinations and it can do, uh, it can do, use various different uh, mechanisms to fail over. And you can use if state D. Now you have to remember with if state D, just to be clear, it only will tell you about a failure at the local point. If there's this failure upstream and a switch, it won't help. Uh, so, so, but often it is better off if you are tra traversing the internet to have some sort of tunneling mechanism that goes down to kind of signal that that, uh, that route is no longer available. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, manners. Now, uh, I'm going to 
I'm going to talk briefly and then I want to introduce Max, who also actually works on matters. And only on uh, uh, May 23rd did I finally get around to filling out the form um, about manners. But I, I have to say it was it's manners and BCP38. OK, we're all in the Internet community. We all get bad traffic. Uh, we all receive traffic, but we can also send bad traffic. Uh, and just to give you an example, if you had a firewall that restarted recently and you have PCs with an open connection, so you have, you know, the NAT states won't actually cover the existing connections, and so they won't be NATs. And what you'll actually find is that the traffic will be just routed default and won't be properly NATs. And so this spillover traffic goes somewhere, has to be routed on the internet to the destination, and then the destination has no way of knowing because it's a private IP where to send that traffic to. Now, that's the benign bad bug on traffic on the internet. Then there's people deliberately trying to take down websites with, uh, you know, spoof traffic. So reverse DNS amplification attacks uh, and stuff like this. BCB38 aims to re reduce by getting ISPs all across the Internet to be good neighbors, good netizens, and try and actually clean up any traffic exiting their network of this type of stuff so that our, our networks are not safe havens for amplification attacks and stuff like that. It also improves your security posture because you stop people doing on net hijacking. So for instance, if you have a Bitcoin miner and you have a wallet with an IP address on your network, you certainly don't want all the Bitcoin miners uh, routing all your Bitcoin wallets uh, just every so often to a third party slash 32 route that was injected into your network. And uh, if you don't believe me that that can't happen, some people made some serious, literally, coin uh, doing that by actually prefix hijacking the network which uh, the Bitcoin miners were using to periodically harvest the coins from the pool. Anyway, so one of the key things is this, you basically, if you're, if I was to summarize BCP38, and uh, Max, please, or Peter, please jump in and tell me if uh, I'm missing anything, is you want to filter your traffic going out of your network that it only contains your public IP space or the IP space of your customers if you're a transit provider, nothing else. Um, and then also coming into your network, the, no traffic coming into your network from outside should have either private IP space or your own IP addresses on it. If, if someone say traffic is saying it's claiming to be from your network, and it's coming from outside your network, chances are it's bad traffic and it should be blocked. It's moved. So these are uh, mechanisms. There are another, other kernel options that you can turn on, like U, um, uh, Unicast Reverse Path Verification, or URPF for short. Loose, if you're going to use it, but uh, implementations, your, your mileage will vary with implementations. And I can safely say that the safest way is really just to do the egress filtering and egress filtering at your edge ports facing uh, your peers and transit providers. You would do a massive amount to clean up. What that doesn't solve though, is let's say Peter and Max are in the same locality and Peter is a bold boy and wants to hack a load of people. So he uses Max's public IP address to do that. Uh, if you don't have URPF on in, within your network, or, or some sort of uh, IP uh, source guard on your network access layer, then Peter will be able to perfect that attack. So that is just something. But it's like what, one of the good things about manners is this mutually agreed uh, norms in routing security. So it's mutually agreed. It, we all encounter problems. And what's great about this is it's a collaborative effort just to improve security in a practical way, and it works. And uh, I just want to pay tribute to the likes of Max, who actually took the time to actually document this uh, and put a website where you can actually wear it like a badge of honor, um, you know. And uh, so you can have that badge of honor too and knock me off the website because my testimonial is this long, but uh, I really do appreciate it. So next slide, please. Um, uh, 
VXLAN. So VXLAN, uh, you know, it's, it's a buzzword. Um, I think VXLAN displaced uh, MPLS successfully from the vernacular in a lot of uh, uh, conferences. Um, and effectively, look, it's it's a 24-bit. It's a way of having multi-tenanted networks within your data center. And you could actually, instead of having 4,000 VLANs with, let's say, your VLAN tags, this is a tunneling technique you can use across the internet, provided there's no on that. Um, you do have to watch MTU issues, but you always have to do that with tunneling. Uh, but what you can do is use this for uh, effectively tunneling your own customer traffic on a customer by customer basis. Um, and it is it is quite uh, useful, and it's a feature that's been available in OpenBSD for about three or four years at least. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it at that. Um, but it is maturing, and uh, you know the, a lot of large switch vendors would implement it in hardware. You sorry, Jan just wanted to put in. Uh, you could also put all routes in via BGP into a table and drop in valid source addresses with stateless block quick rule. Okay, yeah, I, I see. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah, so he was using. You can actually use what Yad is saying there is you, you can use the routers themselves to block bad traffic by black holing to, you know, and I, I like the way uh, he has uh, uh, put that in. And what's really nice about that is if you don't have PF enabled, like on a box that's heavily loaded, uh, some people do turn off PF on that. I will say for firewalling roles, PF being on, or sorry, stateful filtering is much quicker. Uh, but if it's off, um, you, you could actually use the routing engine with just black hole routes uh, to or unreachable routes to actually filter traffic. And if you combine it with URPF, then you get the uh, you get actually the bidirectional because obviously routing just blocks it to the destination. But uh, if you do URPF, you can actually block a based on source as well if they're black holes. Sorry, moving swiftly on to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to skip that. You can look at these slides. Like, uh, and uh, um, I'm going to hand back to Peter, if you don't mind, Peter, because I think you. Oh no! Oh, oh, uh, okay. Third party tools. Okay, so third party tools. There's a couple of tools that I found really useful. PF Top is a package that you install uh, in OpenBSD, and what's really, 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 really nice about it is it gives you the top bandwidth users um, in terms of time and uh, in terms of bytes throughput. So it's a nice way of finding out who's hogging all the bandwidth on a bandwidth constrained link. And uh, it's a really, really, really great tool. Um, it's, it, it could also show, like obviously you could use PFCTL by this SR or PFCTL by this SS. Um, if you want to add it in, it's very straightforward. You can use package add, PKG underscore add, PF top. Another one that's near to my heart because I'm the OpenBSD port maintainer. Uh, so Chris Capuccio wrote uh, Network Shell and it was designed that he wanted to create a, a router that was similar to uh, something that arrives with San Francisco um, that uh, it, you could actually edit everything on the, in terms of routing firewall configuration of the device within one file. And, uh, and have a shell that was similar, like, you know, so you had the interface name, so it would be interface vert IO or VIO zero, and then you could go IP address add. And uh, he he, has, he 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 started it back in 2002, um, and he has been developing this uh, steadily since, and uh, I've been working on it with it in terms of documenting the new features and the features of it, and we've been working uh, because of the work of David Gwynn, MPI, and all the guys, so many new features of OpenBSD's kernel, you know, in relation to networking, uh, ha have to be accommodated in the NSH. So it is really, really good. Oh, sorry, Max is telling me I'm out of time. So I think that's code for sh stop talking. Anyway, but NSH is awesome. Try I it. Out. I didn't want I didn't want to cut you out. I just wanted to mention that we are over time, but. Uh, yes. You guys, you guys can keep going if you want. If if you want to stop, you can stop. But there's nothing coming on for about forty five minutes. 
yeah. I think we have to prepare the 45 minutes, myself and Max. But I will say that the new the wireless, just one thing to watch out for. If you want AC, you can use the full Mac uh, chips from uh, uh, Broadcom and uh, it, it works pretty well. So if you want to use uh, wireless with OpenBSD, that one uh, I would recommend. Or as as often people do, is using you know, like a proprietary bridged um, uh, like a Unify access point with uh, with OpenBSD as the router or the firewall or the bridge behind it. Uh, will there be a recorded this session somewhere? Yes, hopefully heavily edited. Uh, so I, I think I'll have to wrangle with Dan on that one. <laughs> Sorry, I won't Dan. be doing the editing. Here, I, I, can I, I'll volunteer for that because it's self-preservation on that one, you know. Uh, and also so that people don't stop it after 10 minutes. So, uh, But uh, I appreciate your work, uh, Dad, and I wasn't expecting you to edit that one, in fairness. Um, next slide. Questions? Yes, uh, on one of the slides, uh, you mentioned VXLAN. Yep. Um, do you uh, know the trade-offs between the different uh, Encapsulation protocols supported by OpenBSD with regards to point to multi point versus point to point support, throughput, and overhead on the wire. Okay, I, to... I, I've tested various different. Uh, David Gwynn has done an awful lot of work with like the GRE IP, like, uh, so you know, there's Ether IP, EOIP, uh, you know, so there's some of those layer two over layer three protocols. And uh, I I haven't read the source code, so I'm going to be straight up on that. And I have to say, uh, it looks like they they were just adapted it for the various different. Like I know that EOIP is a MicroTik one. I think EtherIP is Cisco. EGRE is another one, possibly Juniper. Um, what I can safely say is testing on like a, a PC engines boxes in a lab uh, in version six. Dot, I'm going to put it at six dot four. Uh, I didn't see much difference in the performance. One key thing I will say is have your underlay, and this is for anyone, have your underlay interfaces larger than your standard MTU size. So it, it, you don't, IP fragments suck so bad that they should never be invented. Uh, it, they, uh, and if you don't believe me, uh, ask Cloudflare, because they actually, in fairness, they wrote a fantastic article and they shared it. And uh, that, this is one thing I like about people who write blogs. But the, one of the problems is that when you have an IP fragment, and this is related to EF and all this, so it's kind of cool. If you NAT, the problem is not every NAT implementation is, is equal. And most people who are, are, who are on mobile networks are NAT two or three times before they get out to the internet. And uh, the first person who gets connected might actually have a proper connection. And then add second and subsequent ones don't have a proper connection. But one of the problems is that the, you know, with normally with most connections, you have a, a topal, you have a source that, source port, destination port, IP, you know, a, a source port, a source IP, a destination IP. And, that, and you can easily track that. You can hash it. And if you're load balancing on links with LACP and all that, all those hashes all work out. Now, if you have to fragment a packet across one of those links, guess what? IP fragment has none of that information. It has the source destination, but it doesn't have the protocol. It doesn't have any of that. And so you become, you become substitute, you get, all I'm gonna say is there's cruel and unusual ways that IP fragments break stuff. And they break it in a very subtle way that will keep you up till about one or two in the morning and it's only when you're doing packet captures that you actually, uh, and, and what, that's something possibly I, we probably could have emphasized more. Packet captures are didn't happen. P caps are didn't happen. Is the best t-shirt I've, apart from Friends Don't Bridge Friends Networks, that's also a really good t-shirt. But packet captures, you, you, you cannot emphasize how awesome they are. And they often, they will show you in black and white the evil of IP fragments. So the one thing I will say is, so if you can control your underlay in your network, which as a provider you would, or as an enterprise. So if you're asking your WAN link providers, ask them for jumbo frames. And when you're asking for jumbo frames, 
ask him for more than 9,000 bytes because that's the bytes you want to send inside. They um, need to have the overhead for all that. Uh, it's a big ask. Like, I mean, I, you know, but... At but, least in uh, FreeBSD, I know from operational experience that you want to be careful with real jumbo frames, not the baby jumbos you need for header stacking, but with 9K or more because lots of drivers have a different allocator where they try to allocate full pages and suddenly you run into kernel heap fragmentation issues. Okay. Uh, well, uh, after a few weeks of uptime. So it's really fun when after a few weeks of uptime, uh, mbuff allocations start sporadically failing. Okay. And, that, and that's a specifically a driver issue. What about with This the is a common driver issue among multiple drivers uh, and if you just send MTU 9000 and let it run for a few weeks, uh, the problem will start to appear under if you actually had a use for it under load. And and one of the, and look, you know, if you are running, let's say ZFS across volumes and stuff like that, you will want to, you know, run big jumbos, as I've said. The reason why I'm saying the no, other thing you have to No, be not really. You want it to run a network card, which does the, uh, TSO LRO for you in firmware slash hardware. Well, but so that you can keep the packet size small, but the CPU overhead gets pushed to an ASIC, I which does so. the TCP offloading or even full uh, iSCSI offloading in theory. But even with the network, would you not like get a benefit of, you know, sandwiching the six packets where one packet would be? Just as a matter of it, like I would have always, let's say, when I'm setting up SANS. You know, like when sure, it, it's, it sounds, it's, it's worth tracking. measuring, but uh, with the, the Connect X5 or 6, it supposedly doesn't matter if okay. your switch can handle it. Yeah. As soon as you hit a router, of course. You're, you're mentioning one thing that's really important. Switches, like particularly with jumbo frames, if you're at 9K, I'll give you an example. Certain switches think 9K is the outside limit of it. But if you're trying to do VXLAN with 9K inside that, you need a switch that can do 92. So a typical figure will be 9214. So you've got 200 bytes of overhead, really, um, mm -hmm. uh, for, for tunneling and tunneling inside, tunneling and so on and so forth. Uh, and the other, but then you have other switches which you do 10K, you know. And uh, the other problem is that some switches, uh, then you get very short queues because they allocate us, uh, the maximum allowed frame size for every frame in their uh, buffer memory. And if you do that, then you'll get really annoying problems because you're suddenly a lot more vulnerable to in-cast collapse. Okay. Because uh, every time a reply you get allocates a maximum sized uh, slot in the switch in the FIFO. So basically your FIFO queue uh, depth uh, gets reduced well, that's if you raise the MTU. And Jan, uh, the will, that the wasn't will. Uh, my problem, but I've seen someone debug it, and in the end, he lost a week's worth of sleep of that. You know, uh, look, when you're dealing with the minutia of this stuff, but the fragments, certainly the large uh, uh, MTUs make sense for the, even for mini jumbos. Uh, don't fragment if you can at all. And it, you can avoid fragmentation with adjusted MSS for TCP loads. Um, but one, you don't control just, all applications. You so can't keep control it at 1500 load. inside your network. And uh, because unless you're messing with uh, Jumbos uh, on your application machines, uh, if you keep the uh, 1500 MTU inside the encapsulation working, you, you have a trouble-free network, even if you drop a little bit performance potential. Yeah. And Jan, you'll be delighted to know that there's a network in Birds of a Feather meeting at some stage on Saturday. And uh, you'll be welcome to join us because uh, I think we'd all like to hear some more uh, good war stories and really good experience, which, you know, and I really do appreciate. I do appreciate your uh, Jan and uh, Len's uh, contributions from a user and the other users, well, I hope you're more interactive in, in our, our in-person session at your BSD con. Um, and, and I just want to say thanks to the, uh, Max and uh, Peter 
uh, for for allowing me on and allowing me to talk and not talk too much. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any questions, any users before we go? Well, if you, if you go on, but I, I, I need a very quick break. <laughs> okay. Anyone want to ask anything else? Don't be shy. Um, I've tried to use point to multi point uh, GIE tunnels with OpenBSD okay. and found out the hard way that OpenBSD's OSPF routing demands neither IPv4 nor IPv6 support point to multi point interfaces. Oh, so you mean uh, the not broadcast NBMA type interfaces? Yeah, the uh, um, so they don't support uh, it in, on the OSPF layer because OTF suffers from IETF brain damage, uh, so they over optimized the um, link state replication. How state is synced over the network and so on, and so there are different kinds of flooding strategies where on a multi Broadcast interface, it uses this, and a point to multi point, it does this, and so on. So that you only s send your information to two uh, routers on each interface, uh, and they take care of replicating them. And because okay. of that, I, had a, I uh, didn't know how to get it working. I had to configure a one point to point tunnel per, um, per uh, endpoint. Okay. which is doable for 20 routers uh, with uh, optimization like Ansible, but uh, would have been neater. In the end, it worked out great because uh, that way I uh, could put each ton uh, OSPF session over a tunnel into its own um, area to keep the flapping tunnels out of the uh, backbone area, but still. Yeah, I guess. So. Would have been... No, but like uh, the 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 OSPF yeah. team and uh, like you know the the support. Let's say the let's say your broadcast domains, your point to point. Uh, but yeah, and that the support that is improving. Uh, but yeah, if you have a non broadcast multiple access network MBMA or something like that, uh, then yeah. it, it it won't work in that situation. I you could know. have tried to use BERT or something, but it has to run as root. And uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I, I, you know, I get you. Like it's uh, now, Peter. Uh, do you want to go through the tunnel uh, troubleshooting session, or are we going to wrap it on this one? Um, well, it's really up to uh, the the audience. Um, it's um, I think we demonstrated that we uh, that the slide books we've uh, accumulated really are for a full day tutorial. <laughs> yeah. And so, so but yeah. anyway, the, the slides are available uh, actually in the same place I've been earlier. Uh, the, yeah. the, there were some updates in, since last time. Um, um, I I have a very specific question regarding tunneling, and that is how what you would. Uh, set up a redundant layer two tunnel to bridge two uh, broken systems together over the internet. So for example, if you have a horrible uh, PBX and very special snowflake voice over IP phones, <laughs> which only work with this specific uh, DHCP server and do some kind of local layer two crap, and you have to tunnel the offsite office is, is uh, that to the system. The, the way I've because... done that, sorry, I'm cutting in on uh, the answer, but it's VIPE, so it's not heavily used. It's not heavy usage, right? Um, no, it's... I'm hoping. Uh, there's less than five megabits of bandwidth on the link yeah. at all times. Okay, well then, um, then open VPN as hideously complicated as it is, but on OpenBSD you can run it not as root. You can run sure. it as a layer two tap, um, and you can run it as UDP in fragment mode, so you can get your full frame. 
1500 bytes through. It's an interesting way of designing it, even though the manual actually says you shouldn't do this. But if you actually want to run full frames over a constrained MTU WAN, um, what's really nice about the algorithm is it splits it. So let's say if you say fragment size is uh, 1300, let's say that's the maximum UDP fragment you want to send. What yeah, it'll do is the software, it'll split it in two. So it'll, if it, once it's over 1300, on 1301 bytes, it says, right, let's split that into uh, uh, 650, two 650 byte packets. And they're said, so it, you do get a cost of doubling your packets per second through, but, but you actually get, uh, you get your full frames across. So that's for your special layer two weirdness uh, that let's say in terms of provisioning the phones uh, and maybe some weird non-IP related um, licensing that they might be doing just to make sure they're all on the same site. So that that is one that has worked for us in the past. Um, but I will say it taps out at about 60 megabits. It's a single process. Um, yeah. On top interfaces are br uh, slow by design because of the uh, ridiculous number of context switches. And the memory. I think it's the memory copy as well. Is not... uh, the memory copy isn't the rest of it. The real problem is that you're doing like four to six context switches per packet. Oh, geez. Okay. That's... Uh, so basically, you have to read the UDP packet into the kernel which is an interrupt at low data rates because you can't aggregate those. And then the kernel receives the UDP packet, dispatches it to the socket, OSPF wakes up, context switches into user lint, reads from the socket, uh, does whatever the encapsulation and decryption it does, which by the way, decryption is a copy, then writes it to the top interface, which is the next system call. Then we open BSDs, routes for packet out and so on. And Fun fact. Encryption or decryption or null encryption has no bearing on the performance of open VPN tunnels. Uh, you know, unless you're using a very slow uh, cipher. Uh, I think I think what you find is those context overheads that you were talking about are far worse than that of the cipher. But uh, older open uh, VPN versions used uh, Blowfish for uh, packet encryption which uh, has a per packet key exchange and so on and then uh, the uh, key schedule for blowfish is equivalent to encrypting four kilobytes of data because oh. you're basically encrypting the initial sbox contents with the key schedule with almost the encryption function uh, and also so you blowfish have... has a very slow uh, key schedule and you, you can improve the, let's say, with the more modern, let's say, GCM rather yeah, than CC, uh, CCMP. Uh, so. Modern hardware accelerated encryption uh, and authentication is almost free. Um, is, uh, with, so, in that situation that you're describing with VoIP low bandwidths, uh, throwing off hardware assets and open VPN would actually work regardless. Uh, I, it pains me to say that. Uh, uh, so, literally, practically every I, other tunnel is more efficient than it. Sure, because what I did try was to uh, tunnel Ethernet over GRE and then use spanning tree. And that way I brought down my whole network <laughs> because OpenBSD's uh, rapid spanning tree implementation uh, tried to speak rapid spanning tree inside uh, the VLAN and not on the outside the VLAN with mm -hmm. per VLAN rapid spanning tree, which uh, confused the switches to stop uh, forwarding on all the interfaces, basically putting all the router interfaces into non-forwarding mode. Well, there's a lesson in that for everyone. And, uh, and pardon me if I dump this down a bit. Yes. Spanning tree sucks. And the only thing that sucks more than spanning tree is the loop it tries to prevent, but <laughs> it's just marginally better. <laughs> so, sorry. Yes, <laughs> but I, the idea uh, I wanted to test was to have 
uh, spanning tree between the two tunnels only. Okay. So I have two OpenBSD routers on one side with carp and so on in a VLAN. And then I wanted to bridge one VLAN over two tunnels on two different routers to a single router on the other side. And then use just three routers in spanning tree. Um, one option. But, uh, as I said, uh, the uh, HP switches uh, crapped themselves. What, what I would suggest in that scenario, guys, is use if you use something with tunneling that has a state, so uh, like for instance, over VPN, for argument's sake, on low bandwidth usage, uh, you actually get, if you use um, the, the open VPN with a, a bonding interface, or, you know, so in that case, so, uh, like either fail over you because the link state goes down, it'll fail over. So if you, if you keep a live mechanism, uh, like with a, a, a EOIP or something like that, or over VPN with its keep alive, you can actually get that failover, and you don't, and so you don't have a loop because you you know the bonding will only use the bond or the team interface will only use whichever link is the primary, and if that goes down, it'll just fall over to the secondary. Um, in the end, well, yeah. In the end, it was uh, not clean. That easiest to just have the if state D, watch the uh, tunnels IPsec uh, session, and assume if the uh, IPsec uh, security association is there because the IPsec keep alive timers are short, that then uh, the router is available. No, oh, that, that's a that's an interesting way, and, and I suppose because you're using if state D, you're using that to monitor the, the interface state, and then you're failing over according to that. Uh, it's not pretty, but it worked. That's that's what we all do. We we do work that's sometimes not pretty, but as long as it works. So there is no clean solution, you know. Of. No, not like no, like what we've used, which I thought was pretty clean, was two tunnels. And then a teaming interface, uh, like so, here to the mid. And I've used that with multiple different vendors, which can be cantankerous to say the least. Uh, but rather than using, and part of the problem is if you have spanning tree with multiple switch vendors, with multiple bridge uh, operating yes. systems, do the bridging, uh, like, like that issue you had where it's, is it per VLAN or is it a, a you know, you can have all sorts of trouble. And I mean, like, you're not, it's not the first, you and I won't be the first people and the last people to, to discuss spanning tree mismatches between different vendors and, and, and even different I, I, IP uh, or IT providers and their understanding of it. Um, like, you know, you could, you could, you could also, like one of the things you have to be careful of is that you can bridge a physical interface that's a trunk and it has multiple spanning tree coming in. So you can take a trunk and then bridge it all into just one. But thing. do you have multiple spanning tree or do you have per VLAN spanning tree? This is a different protocol. True, true. But but what I'm saying is you could dump it in well, on one and use, if you have a bridge, if you have a bridge, you can actually convert. It. I won't say convert, but you can actually confuse the switch that's, Expected yes, to see it done by accident. But, 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 but absolutely. No, I would look uh, like we don't actually run spanning tree in our network. I hate that. Uh, so, what we're doing is uh, we're doing the uh, bridge horizons, we do port isolation, that type of scenario uh, where we can. And that's how we actually mitigate against. And uh, we're, you know, using multi chassis lags, M MC lags for the redundancy. So, oh, yeah. That's another point where lots of uh, bugs are lurking in switch operating systems. I've yet to see a reliable multi-chassis lag with no uh, corner cases. Um, I would have to say, in defense of my my, uh, I did, did I just configured it right, but I would have to say Arista's MC lag into, and I just shout out to Arista, and I'm not trying to advertise, I'm not sponsored by them. 
But man, I love their MC likes. They work, and I really mean that. Uh, from uh, different versions, I have some old switches with an ancient version of, of uh, EOS. And uh, all I'm going to say is that MC lag is the gift that keeps giving. And, you know, and I've hard tested. <laughs> I agree on that. Uh, it's a gift that keeps on giving new uh, state synchronization problems. <laughs> no, I, no, I genuinely like it, It's kind of like, I go to quote Winston Churchill. It's the worst thing we've ever tried except for everything else, like he was talking about democracies. It's the worst uh, system of coverage, except everything else we tried. Uh, so it could so, cause multi-path routing. Uh, I, look, Get your layer free closer to the edge. Okay, but that said, the problem with equal cost multi-path routing is if you lose a state, you can black hole a hell of a lot of traffic. And at least with multi-chassis yes. likes, that, the, you know, the, the, the way the switches actually communicate with is a fault. It's, it's compelling. Mm. Uh, anyway, if one of your, uh, if one of the uh, receive only control plane freezes and the uh, data plane keeps on forwarding, it's a time bomb just waiting. Yeah. No, so, no. because that's what I have seen with HP, Cisco, and Juniper in some form or other, that it will just. One of the control planes crashes, the data plane of this part of a multi chassis lag maintains its state. And at some point, you uh, you suddenly have a loop. It, it, there is a split plane scenario, which I think you're pointing out, but often with a switch, you could select which one would be the... Uh, uh, the... Yes, but there is no reliable uh, Stunneth circuit in most MC lag solutions. At least in the all close to affordable ones. Yeah. So, so what I found with the with the let's say the rest of implementations is that you need to have multiple peer links, which you know the routers. And it ways, you know, the, multiple the, links won't help you if a control plane crashes. No, but surely the one that's not crashed will recognize that the other one's crashed because they have to they have to see. Yes, that. and then it says, "Oh, I'm suddenly alone." I'm the only control plane left. I have to keep on working. I get you. Yeah, no, it, 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 look, if, if there is a software bug, it, I, look, it, it was something we didn't touch on. Like, uh, you know, you have uh, PF sync and stuff like that. And I suppose, look, I'm conscious. I We've a half an hour before the next meeting starts, but and, uh, I, it, um, I just want to, I go to head back to Peter actually. Uh, sorry, Peter, just to close out the session. Uh, and uh, if there was anything else you wanted to add, or not, not really. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, the uh, slides are, are all already online, and the, the labs will be up for some time. Uh, that's yeah. um, you, you. You were talking about a day or two, or. Yeah, a couple of days. So, like, mm. if people want to, or like, we can arrange specific access for people as well. If if you if you're not used to OpenBSD and you'd like to play around with it a bit more, we'd be happy to facilitate that in any way we can. Uh, and yeah, and I really do appreciate the questions, Len. I appreciate your interaction earlier, and everyone else. Uh, Dan, thanks for organizing the conference again. The Trojan work, really appreciate it. You're welcome.